is no place to escape to. This is the last time. On the left. <laughs> That's when the cannibalism started. I just get to be my clothes and stuff, I don't need to buckle it in. No, you don't. You just be you, man. Just yeah. be me, man. Be, be you, bro. That's what everything, I think that's what every series we've ever done, that's really what's ever been about. Is just be you, bro? Be, be you, bro. Be you, dude. Because guess what, man? Guess who doesn't, guess what the other guy gets to do? What? what? Be them. Oh. You can't be you. Oh. The only person going to be you is you, except for me. I'm many. Right. You're an actor. I'm an actor. There is a no man of many voices that all sound Jamaican at some point. At some point, only because, as we now know, as I have discovered, which one day linguistic experts will say, they will yeah. understand that the base of every single speaking accent is Jamaican. Fantastic. Ah. Yeah. There we go. And are you many or are you truly none? I'm truly none. Yes. You're yeah. truly oh. a pitcher waiting to be filled with another personality. I am zero, right? <laughs> Today, technically, I'm Chuck Dieterich. Chuck <laughs> Henry Chuck oh my gosh. Right? So, again, Henry's gone, yeah. right? That's why yes. I'm impervious to any form of crime or being accused of a crime. <laughs> because anytime you, right. you put that on me, I'll be like, Who's the, who are you talking about? Yeah. That was Mr. Benchipent, right? <laughs> ah, Mr. Who is a magical heart haberdasher yeah. Yeah. who happened to maybe not fill out all the forms for his taxes that he should have been. But that's him. That was that guy doing it, yes. not me. Yeah. And when you get to prison, of course, you'll be the sexiest little mushroom boy around. <laughs> Welcome to Last Podcast on the left, everyone. We are on to the troubled teen industry part two, specifically focusing on Sinanon. Sinanon. Before there was QAnon. There was Sinanon. Now, as we said last episode, the troubled teen industry certainly had spiritual precedents in America, such as the American Indian boarding schools that operated until the late 1960s. But when it comes to direct inspiration, no organization was more influential than Sinanon. And can you believe it was created? By a 300-pound bag of gnocchi <laughs> with half a missing face who somehow, like, while being a, a true villain of American history, yeah. is also one of the funniest guys you'll ever meet. Well, that's good. I'm happy he's fat and funny because fat and disgruntled. Michael Moore, Rob Reiner, yeah. it's a bad look. <laughs> Rob Reiner be like, no, no one should smoke. I was just watching the South Park episode where they made fun of Rob Reiner. So basically, I'll just copy and paste that <laughs> episode yeah, just... into a written statement. Really good. Really good. See, while the physical tortures inflicted on teenagers like spankings, Ooh. solitary confinements, and beatings, they can be thought of by any regular old Joe. No, man, I spanked myself today. Yeah. I know you did. I've seen the tushy footage. <laughs> the thing about solitary, the thing about really suffering with torture, you can't flip it and reverse it. Yeah. The spanking, you can get hard. Oh, That's yeah. right. The Again, spanking, yeah. you can really be like, one more, daddy. Yeah, yeah. And then be like, oh, let's not do it. But solitary, you really can't pretend to like no. it. I yeah. love this. I love <laughs> Uh, being alone, alone. That yeah. only can last for so long. Well, they can yeah. also, they can just leave the room. Yep. And then you're just screaming at yourself. Yeah. Right. Guess what? Once you're alone with yourself, I should know very well, everything stops being entertaining. <laughs> well, while any regular old Joe can do physical torture, the psychological techniques used to pound these teens into square pegs, oh. they were adapted from a complicated method of attack therapy created by Synanon called The Game. I've seen some YouTube footage, and Steven Seagal also does attack therapy. He does, <laughs> but he all he has to do is this tiny little like his little flipper baby arms, and then he can always defend himself a little time. But today's episode is really kind of again the origins of what we just kind of touched on in the first episode and kind of where it all led mm -hmm. because this is uh, again it's not a synonym series, it's a troubled teen industry series. Right. But then uh, synonym. There's lots to unpack here. Yeah. Uh, wow. There was a 10 episode podcast just about Synodon done by Robert Downey Jr. Is that right? When you say by Robert Downey Jr. What do you mean by? He was in an office at the same time <laughs> when people <laughs> under his name made a podcast about it. Gotcha. So he showed up. Are you sure he showed up? I'm certain that he was told at some point that he was doing that. <laughs> but then when it came down to it, he's still begging to be Tony Stark again. I yeah. would believe Robert Downey Jr. He grew up troubled mm -hmm. teen industry that is Holly weird. Yep. He was addicted to drugs. His father had him doing cocaine at like 12. So I actually think he might be a proper voice in this. Now he's totally sober and his wife saved his life. Yep, oh that's what, yeah, that's what I actually like Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, I do so too. Do I. He, uh, so that do Letterman interview he did was actually very interesting. Powerful, powerful. 
Well, unfortunately, the people who founded and ran these troubled teen programs that took inspiration from Synanon, they were mostly sociopaths. Mm. Ergo, they simplified Synanon's game to such a degree that this well-meaning method for kicking addiction became the worst psychological torture of all. That's what's fun about an effective tool is that it's a shovel, right? Mm -hmm. You can dig a, a trench, right? But it can be used to feed children. You yes. can fill it with slop and so children will eat it. And then you can <laughs> also maybe water, maybe water. Sure, or, whatever, yeah. yeah or slop water. Yeah, at the yeah. same time, that, that same trench, you can then push the kids into the slop. Now it's a grave. <laughs> Great. <laughs> but before we get into exactly... It's very good, right? A, it's very a good. I love it. grave. I love yes. it. Yeah, it's like either get from slop bucket to grave. Yep. Yeah. It's That's that it. Simple. Mm. All it takes is a, there you go. Well, there you go. One little push. It's amazing. You can make any hole a grave if you <laughs> just, just push, push somebody into, into it. it. Yeah. yeah. But before we get into exactly what the game was, let's talk about who created the game and where it was practiced. That was a drug rehab turned cult called Synanon. For this episode, our main source is The Rise and Fall of Synanon by Rod Jansen. While some argue that it's too soft on Synanon, mm-hmm. it seems to be the most fair and balanced history of this fascinating organization right up to their dissolution following a bungled and bizarre attempted murder. And if you do want even more information, there's a lot of it out there. Obviously, I brought up that podcast, but also there is the website, paulmorantz.com, that comes from the perspective of a person that very distinctly has a bone to pick. <laughs> <laughs> with Synanon, and you'll yeah. see why uh, as we get through this episode. But his is really, him. he basically, he's like, the rise and fall of Synanon doesn't understand the degrees of violence that we all suffered, but we'll see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it really is a perfect um, crop to pick from when it comes to Synanon, former drug addicts or people dealing with drug addiction. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, they're looking for help, and then obviously they're going to be in massive peril when they go through withdrawals and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like, and now we get to experiment on you. We took you at yeah. your most babyish form when you were literally yeah. dying. Like, you were super sick from your and then we, like, took that dismantled personality of someone getting over drugs, and now we're going to rebuild you in our way, which is a yellow screaming, a, 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 a yelling, screaming soldier for a man for with half a face. That's yeah. why I'm going to start a new company, Ice Cream for Diabetics. <laughs> <laughs> they need it to live. There is that. Oh. Well, concerning that attempted murder, we also used an article about Synanon published in 2018 in Los Angeles Magazine by Hillel Aaron, Hmm. which nicely covers the incident that led to the downfall of the largest cult you've never heard of. Synanon was originally established as a sincere drug rehabilitation program in the 1950s that became a full-fledged cult by 1975. What were the drugs in the 1950s? Wizards, zappers, poppers, poopers? <laughs> Man, heroin. I, heroin. So heroin. much heroin. But oh, also, I, I love to find out, because it seems like the heroin there was, like, real good yeah. in the 50s. Really? Uh, I yeah. Mean, it's I Charlie don't... Parker heroin. It's good shit. Wow. Okay. CIA heroin. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Well, no, but they didn't... Well, no. I, say, I would hey, say later heroin is more CIA heroin. Okay. Yeah, that's when they started, like, and then, you know, they invented crack, which must have been a fun mm. afternoon, and then, like, that that's a whole other th- episode. This is, in. like, mobster heroin. Okay. Yeah. Now, billed as a community striving for a creative and effective approach to drug rehabilitation, Synanon was not the first drug rehab center, but it was among the first to be taken seriously. See, prior to the 50s, people with drug addiction problems with substances like heroin, they were either thrown in jail or mental institutions without even an attempt at treatment because the word treatment concerning addiction wasn't even in the lexicon. Usually, the addicts caught in this cycle would shuttle in and out of these institutions until they died from their addiction or diseases of poverty, while the general public sort of just shrugged and said, what are you going to do? Well, because, again, it was a, a problem that was kind of like new in it, even though it wasn't. No. It, it was an interesting way to kind of like, we're looking at it for the first time. We're really now as a society all like kind of seeing like, hey, it seems like a lot of people like heroin. <laughs> well, I mean, I think they missed a massive opportunity. Give them a guitar. Give them one of those little drums with the sticks that have like the little things. On. <laughs> oh, you're talking again. Jazz. Jazz. It was a Give them a guitar. About jazz. Oh. They're my brush sticks. Yeah. Brush sticks. Yeah. Yeah. It's about the notes you don't play. <laughs> yeah, it should really. Yeah. You know, jazz drumming should make all the hair on your neck stand up. Yeah. But once Synanon became popular, and once people saw that it got results, people began to believe that addicts didn't have to die in streets like dogs. Wow. What? On the contrary, they could be rehabilitated and live normal lives under the right circumstances. And Synanon provided the framework for those circumstances by inventing a culture of recovery. Specifically, Synanon pioneered the idea of the ex-addict 
turned drug counselor. Mm -hmm. Okay. And as a result, graduates of the Synanon program, ex addicts all, opened their own successful treatment centers in San Francisco, Tucson, Manhattan, and Queens. I just really hope they don't try this same thing with pedophiles. Right. Uh, you know, the only that's going to lead to a lot of horror. <laughs> Unless you could teach the pedophiles to be attracted to other pedophiles. Huh. Right? Like, you get a, a super sexy pedophile in <laughs> right. there amongst okay. the other oh, pedophiles. Oh, yeah, all those right, supers. Listen. I've seen Chris Hansen. <laughs> They're always super sexy well, when they come through the door. Every yeah. once in a while, there's, a, there's like a kind of like a, like a R. Kelly. Technically, he's a handsome pedophile, sure, right? Okay, and sure. And so you get him in there, right? He gets them all ra- lathered up and shit. Uh-huh. Maybe then they can also fall in love with each other. Be like, just imagine I have a big lollipop. Imagine I'm much smaller. Right. <laughs> right? I feel so like you're really onto something. Yeah, so your your idea is to treat pedophiles with the... Magic of imagination? Yes. Wow. You mean the what? power of theater, which is why when I do my all pedophile Titus Andronicus, all of the LA's fine art community will arrive yeah. to see my work. Just one lonely person clapping in the back, and that indeed is Rob Reiner. <laughs> well, Synanon was actually founded right here in the greater Los Angeles area, out in Santa Monica, by a man named Chuck Diederich, who actually coined the phrase, Today is the first day. The rest of your life. Wow, you never realized that someone had to say that first. Yeah, that was a synonym phrase. Wow. Yeah, so what's tomorrow? The second day of the rest of your fucking life, you moron. <laughs> Whatever, it's, dude. It's the second day of your life. Second day's first loser. But if you... T- <laughs> if- <laughs> We're not playing Mario Kart. <laughs> well, Chuck Diedrich was a golf... <laughs> Doesn't even make sense. Yeah. <laughs> second day's first loser, man. Yeah, you nailed it. Whatever, Doc. Really good. Chuck Diedrich was a Gulf oil sales executive from Toledo, Ohio, who was a self-admitted alcoholic for 20 years. Hmm. His drinking problem was blamed on a bout of meningitis that required a mastoidectomy that caved in the right side of his face. Let's just say I got phantom cheek syndrome. What the problem <laughs> is, is every time I try to drink, I just imagine, oh, I got an extra cheek. I got a fill ball. Turns out it's not there. So now I'm drinking double. Whoa. <laughs> is, was part of his brain gone No, then? part of his skull. Just part of his skull. Yeah, the, I think a mastoidectomy, I, I looked it up, like I think they just kind of pull out part of your skull. It's because all infected. Men, meningitis, yeah, they just kind of scoop it out. And because they scoop it out, like half of your face is flat because it doesn't have any bone. How did he get Didn't meningitis? He was he sucking toes or something? What happened? <laughs> he got it as a kid. Oh. He got it as a kid. Abraham it was, it was Lincoln. a whole thing. Oh. Didn't he have that? Meningitis? A mastoidectomy? No, he was just in the closet. Face. No, 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 no. He sucked dick, but he only did it with the half, half of his face that fucking worked. There was something that he did. No, he did. had a full functioning face until Work. he was shot off. No, yeah. he had it. It was just, he was dying Diagnosed with a facial defect. <laughs> That's just people being rude in the yeah. 1800s. He's an yeah. aberration called cranial facial microsomy. That's just what they called people who they thought were ugly back yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He just has skeleton head. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> By the early 1950s, Chuck Diedrich was just a regular schlub in Toledo with a divorce under his belt. Oh. So he moved to Southern California to gain some perspective, and he brought his drinking problem with him. I'll tell you what, the divorce certainly was under my belt because she certainly was fucking me in my ass. <laughs> there you go. I understand financially, perhaps. <laughs> By 1956, when Chuck was 43 years old, his second wife left him because of his continued drinking. Yeah, he could still pull. Yeah. And he looked like a, a yeah, he looks it, like a fucking Captain Planet villain. But it was back in the day where if you even look at someone for like 15 seconds, you're like, well, we better make this official. Yes. <laughs> and then you go get married. Well, after she left him, she suggested on her way out the door that he might try Alcoholics Anonymous if he ever wanted to get his shit together. Okay. This is, he's 43 okay. before Synanon even begins. That shows life doesn't end at 40. That's right. No, it doesn't. And sure enough, once Chuck started attending AA meetings in Beverly Hills, he fell in love with the AA process, partly because he could use the meetings as an open mic to tell stories, oh. which were, by all accounts, quite entertaining. He's straight, straight up. He better have been. <laughs> he he stand up comedy his way into being a cult leader because mm-hmm. wow. he once he started going to AA because you know you do testimonies in AA we yeah. don't know because I am not a quitter <laughs> but like, no. you don't go and like you you de- like you talk about like what your experience was and he'd go up there and he'd chappelle it yeah. he'd take the mic for like fucking 45 minutes when everyone's waiting but he's crushing so hard and he's running the light <laughs> no one wants to stop okay. and he keeps slapping the mic with his knee every wow. time he laughs that's Chappelle's. that's his that's his uh, copyright move yeah. mm-hmm. After two years in AA, 
Diedrich decided to participate in an experiment at UCLA that wanted to test the effectiveness of LSD on alcoholics. And this may or may not have been one of the lighter MK Ultra experiments, but, you know, not every yeah. LSD experiment done at a university in the late 50s was funded by the CIA. Just most of them were funded that it, by the it, CIA. It, it the vast majority, abs- 99% of them were funded by the CIA. I definitely think it falls into the realm of coincidence of the fact that it's another person that is in this counterculture world that was touched by some form of, I think it... What did we learn about MK Ultra? The ultimate, like, the, the best part about them is that, like, you don't even know you're MK Ultra until fucking years later. You didn't Can't know until the fucking 80s that you were MK Ultra because you just were getting, like, sh- that shadow money. So, yeah. you know, it did. It, it, apparently, it had a lot of, like, long reaching, like, consequences. Consequence. Absolutely. Yeah. What about sobriety? Positive and negative. Doesn't uh, taking mm-hmm. a bunch of acid inhibit your sobriety? No. Well, that's what no, it Dieter doesn't. Said. No. We'll, we'll talk about this because then, you know, how much. Seems I, like he's not sober if he takes a bunch of acid. Technically, <laughs> you're Cali sober if you do everything but alcohol. Okay. Yeah. Because that's the thing. He's staying off of alcohol. But I thought AA was but also like that's a what this wide. Now, that's, okay, that's what we'll we're get getting into, into. Yeah. I mean, Diedrich said that the experience was highly beneficial, made him look about at his alcoholism in an entirely new way. Yeah, right? actually, my alcoholism is a tetrahedron inside this <laughs> crystal that is my soul. And the only thing I need to do is understand me, understand pizza, and I will <laughs> defeat my own alcoholism. <laughs> But it rubbed the Alcoholics Anonymous leadership the wrong way because they believed that the only things you needed to not drink alcohol was coffee, cigarettes, and a higher power. Ooh. Also very bad for you. Yeah. Cigarettes probably the worst of all. Mm-hmm. Sometimes something's got to give. Yeah. yeah. Again, it w- we said for the last episode, let the kids vape. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, this belief had actually never sat all that well with Chuck Diedrich in the first place. He'd never been comfortable with AA's religious focus Uh. because he believed that it was important for addicts to develop Mm self-reliance. He did, however, believe that the group therapy and community aspects of AA were key. Mm -hmm. You're never going to find Helena Bonham Carter when you go to these meetings. (laughs) What? Fight club. Fight club. It's all men. That are yeah, overweight you can still, and chain smoking. In and also, AA, I believe you're not supposed to have sex with the other people that are in your chapter. I believe that that is against it. You're not supposed to date. Yeah, because you're not supposed here. to, but I mean, where that's your friend group. That's I don't know. Be your old, <laughs> what else are you going to do? That's I don't know. The bar I, now. I feel yeah. like there's a lot of sexy, challenged people <laughs> in these groups. You never know. Maybe. It might be. Who knows? So after the AA leadership insisted that he find treatment elsewhere because of his LSD use, Mm. Chuck decided to start his own version of addiction treatment that would fall in line with his own beliefs. That's confidence. So AA is the reason Synanon exists. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's because it's his reaction to it. And is it because he also was an atheist and he did not believe in the higher power aspect of it. He wanted to find a secular way to do it. But it is interesting to see that he just loved being on mic so much that he was just like, I need to do this for a living. I need to call Big J. <laughs> I need to get in the mix in the Austin scene. Absolutely. But once he began tapering off from AA meetings, other recovering alcoholics would check up on him because they liked him. It's pretty much his fans were like, Hey, bro, you never come into AA meetings anymore. You're fucking crushing the meeting, dude. Where are you, man? Wow. <laughs> fucking sucks without you there. Wow. And those checkups, they evolved into impromptu meetings. And those impromptu meetings evolved further into thrice weekly meetings in Diedrich's apartment. He is correct in the fact that the fucking the cult arrived to him at first yeah. before it became a cult. The group just showed up. Wow, so this is really, he's like, I didn't ask you to come here. You all just showed up. Yeah. I guess I'm a cult leader now. I think he did a little bit of like, yeah, I've heard those meetings are boring without me. Like he did a couple of that being like, he knew. And then he started like, you know, hitting him him with the charm, hitting him with the sparkle. Mm -hmm. Okay. What changed everything, though, was when a heroin addict named Whitey Walker joined the group just after he was released from prison. Now, the group therapy sessions led by Diedrich were always a little more aggressive than what they had in AA because that's how Diedrich liked it. But Whitey Walker introduced a new dynamic. Soon, Whitey was bringing other addicts that Diedrich non-pejoratively referred to as dope fiends. Mm -hmm. And the more dope fiends that showed up, the coarser the language got and the more aggressive the sessions became. Diedrich is of the Tony Robbins school. That cursing and like 
saying like super hyper confrontational things like make it helps engage street people like yes. people like and makes you f feel more real or like grounded like this idea that don't, i'm a real guy I'm just don't a normal demean guy. the great name of donia robbins he's, he's six foot seven and above so i must support him he has a lot of there's a lot of issues around tony robbins right now but yeah. it's his style was this this is kind of where it came from it was because Diederich thought it was like i'm yelling at these guys and he's calling them dope fiends in a way of like it's kind of like a light roasting yeah, because it's bit. about us Taking the word back. Whitey like, Walker definitely should have been doing cocaine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the yeah, name yeah, yeah, like yeah. Whitey Walker. That guy, all white suit, pimped out, full of beautiful, pure, uncut Colombian cocaine. It'd be cool <laughs> if you find out you think he's a coke dealer, but it just turns out he just sells milk. <laughs> <laughs> 2%, huh? <laughs> but the thing is, is that Diedrich, with these super abrasive meetings, very aggressive. He was getting results in a way that AA wasn't getting results because these, and he's getting results with fucking heroin addicts. Wow. So when the gatherings got too big for Diedrich's apartment, he went for broke and leased a storefront in Santa Monica. He invited 20 alcoholics and so-called dope fiends to come live there in what was effectively an early version of a rehab facility. Hold on a second. We had a hard time getting a fucking lease in New York because we have a podcast studio. Yep. <laughs> um, how the hell did the landlord be like, so 20 dope feeds, former alcoholics up, come right in. Actually incredible. I have a couple of couches I want to give you guys, but I need them <laughs> back. I'm just lending them to you. No, it's uh, it was a different time period. Yeah. No, Remember, they, this no, was, no, they didn't like it. They, they fucking hate Like He didn't tell them. Hey, we're going to be moving a Good. bunch of heroin addicts and alcoholics into this place. And then once he did, once they figured out what was going on, the entire neighborhood was to get the fuck out of here. Okay. It was the first of many confrontations that what? Chuck Diedrich would have with his neighbors. Much he does as, not get along well with others. Much as people feel of influencers now. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> technically, I don't want to illustrate where we were at, but there is an influencer house down the street. And it is pretty funny to pull up and watch like two guys doing weird like Muay Thai karate on like a, a, a dummy out front while another guy shoots them and a girl's twerking next to them. <laughs> and then you kind of wonder yeah. like, like, are y'all Paying for these? Are you paying for anything, or is this is some else? Some is Robert Downer Johnny Jr. paying for this too? I think they're making that money on the ticket. Uh. <laughs> as far as what Chuck wanted to call his new venture, the origins of the name are debated. Some say that it's a combination of the words symposium and seminar, while others think it's a play on the words sinners, synthesize, or synagogue. But no matter the origin, what came out the other end was synonym. Well, again, great name. Yeah. Three syllables. There's something about it keeping it, and it sounds like it's connected to recovery because yeah. you have stuff like, you know, Alcohol is Anonymous, there's Al-Anon, there's Narconon, like all those things that are a part of it. It sounds like a, I think Narconon is technically Scientology. No, is it? I think I, I might I don't be. think Narconon's Scientology. I mean, we'll get it. We'll, we'll yeah, I know out. someone who does Narconon meetings, and I don't think, they don't seem like the type who will go to a Scientology. They thing. don't say that if there's one of those that like, was, they don't say that it is. I was trying to figure out what the term Anon means and evidently it means anonymous. It means shortly. <laughs> it says I'll see you Anon yeah. which I guess means soon or <gasps> shortly. Literally yes that's, yeah, that's Shakespeare. Yeah that's I should yeah, see you Anon. Yeah yeah yeah. But yeah. If, in this case it's anonymous. Anonymous yeah. yeah. Yeah yeah. Yeah it is on Scientology.org they have Narconon right at the very top. Wow. Great. Yep wow. Good. Okay. Perfect. Well, Good to know. Yeah. That's how they get you. <laughs> you just never know. You never know. I mean, let's see. At least this is on the website. A lot of guys looking at pamphlets on this website, so there's a lot of interest building. No. Yeah. <laughs> now, Diedrich believed that addiction was not so much an illness that could be cured as it was a behavioral problem that was caused by underlying social and psychological issues, which ain't a bad guess. You know? No. It's, yeah. not. it's a bit but, of both, isn't it? But it is worth noting that Diedrich was a salesman. Before he found it, and I'll tell you, I can, I can sell. You don't think I can sell? I can sell a ketchup popsicle to a bitch that likes mustard. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I knew you were going to steal that line from Tommy Boy, and I called you on it. <laughs> Your father was such a good salesman; he could sell a ketchup popsicle to a woman, woman wearing in white, white gloves. gloves. Oh, ketchup popsicle. <laughs> we're forty. Marcus, you'll be forty next week. I will be. I'll be forty a week from today. Wow. Welcome to the you club. Know what? I tell you what. We're only getting younger, and we're getting no. more fresh, and we're getting more available to the young. The culture's getting younger and older at the same time, so we're yeah. evening out. We're evening sure. out. I mean, wow. I'm right in the middle. I'm where I should be. Yep. Yeah, right uh, we middle. don't have any choice. No, it's not our. It's not up to us. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dietrich had no more experience in treatment care than the people who founded Straight Ink or Wasp. 
But to place Diedrich apart, he was rarely sadistic hmm. and could be said in at least the first 10 years to have been quite caring. He seemed oh, like a fun guy for a while. For a while. Yeah. And he did, he was sadistic sometimes. Oh, he and got to there. He, no, he got extremely violent. Yeah, to definitely. Be honest. Well, I wouldn't say extremely violent. When we're talking about cults. Ah. Well, after Ant Hill Kids, yeah. <laughs> nothing can be called violent or again. Or Jonestown. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. But that was just the one big one. <laughs> I mean, I remember, like, sometimes you want to smack your friend who's just hung over because they're annoying. Yeah. So it must truly be difficult to deal with a bunch of people who are going through <laughs> withdrawal. Like, sometimes you'd just be like, Tommy, <laughs> your shit is, belongs in the toilet, not on your face. <laughs> and so at some point, you do have to kind of get upset. Well, wow, yeah. that's the thing. You're, man, you're about to have your mind fucking blown. Yes. here. Yeah, <laughs> well, similar to other cult leaders with initial good intentions like Jim Jones, Chuck's ego eventually got out of hand. And while it never got to Jonestown levels, Chuck and Jim's paths would cross just before the shit hit the fan in Guyana. Wow. Think about this. This shit's happening in SoCal. There is a what? lot of the same guys. Elrond's in town. <laughs> Fucking Jim Jones is in town. He's in town. These people Jim like Parsons. These again? guys are all there, dude. No. It's just all wild to think that like all of this shit was happening. Like Charles Manson. No. All this shit was happening at the same time. Yeah. And this guy, Chuck Diedrich. Live from your grave. Tight deadlines can leave us feeling less than jolly, especially when you're coming back relaxed from a holiday break or not. Grammarly's communication assistants can help you get your work done confidently and productively so you can have more time for what you love, building your killdozer. Say goodbye to simple mistakes on important emails and documents. The free version of Grammarly offers instant proofreading with comprehensive spelling, grammar, and punctuation suggestions. Plus, by using cues from your writing, it analyzes how your message is coming across. Yep, Grammarly helps detect the tone of your writing for free. Grammarly Premium's clarity-focused sentence rewrites help keep your writing clear and to the point to keep your workflow productive and completed on time. You deserve a break from the grind. Get there confidently with Grammarly Premium. Go to Grammarly.com slash podcast to sign up for an account and download. And when you're ready to upgrade to Grammarly Premium, get 20% off. That's 20% off at G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y dot com slash P-O-D-C-A-S-T. Now, Synodon became truly innovative starting in 1959 with the introduction of the cop-out method, which was later used extensively and wrongly in the troubled teen schools. See, a lot of addicts at Synodon were admitting that they were still using drugs, and they knew that other people were still using drugs, but they were keeping it all to themselves because their brains were hardwired against snitching. It's the mm. number one criminal crime. Yeah. It's to snitch. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and you get learned it's omerta. Yeah. And I mean, you don't fucking tell everybody everybody's business because you never know who's a fucking cop. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But Diedrich convinced everyone in Synodon that snitching on yourself and others was not only preferable, but essential to the recovery process to snitch. Honesty, he said, bound you to the community. And that concept became central to Synodon's most well-known and influential method. See, after several open-ended discussions in which people snitched on each other's drug use, the group began digging deeper at what else everyone was keeping secret. Mm. People started getting very honest about everything. People stop being fake and start getting real. Well, that's what it's they the wanted. on real world house. <laughs> it's, it, that is kind of where all that came from. I do believe that this is the, the true inspiration for all of that style of shit of like mm -hmm. we, we would get into like. I mean, the only thing missing we, is cameras and Dr. Drew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this inspired what came to be known as the game. In the game, all players were required to be intimately honest with each other using a series of what they called indictments to attack hypocrisy and fraud in a fellow group member. Also, I know another game, and you just lost it. Why? Oh, yeah. What? Yeah. The game. You but, just lost it. It's a, why? Don't you don't need to? He doesn't know this. No, no. no. What? It's like game. schoolyard, man. <laughs> School you never game. had time on the school guard, the schoolyard. <laughs> no, I was out there with all the boys. No, you weren't. You weren't. Yeah, with I all played the girls. handball. We... No, you didn't. No, no, I played handball, and then we did sometimes play like married life, where I would be a husband. Oh my god! <laughs> and then I played superheroes, and then <laughs> yeah. we played with the Ouija board. Uh -huh. and, but I did play handball. Okay. You played you played handball. Oh yes. <laughs> I sported. It's a little racket. Um, but the game is a thing that you say, and then if you say the game, you become aware of the game, you've lost it. Yeah. 
<laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's like I'm talking to my father. <laughs> I don't know. So no, disappointed. No, I'll no, be, you I'll be like your a... father. <coughs> <coughs> Henry Thomas. <laughs> oh, God. End me. Now you're making End me sad. Me. Now it's too real. Oh. You sound like a teenager trying to explain 4chan to his uncle. It's difficult. Like how cool 4chan is. It's cool, man. It's <laughs> new. It's now it's 4chan, board. so that's the fourth grandson of Jackie Chan. <laughs> <laughs> is that correct? <laughs> well, in the game... Like I said, all players were required to be intimately honest. And the idea was that this introduced a brutal kind of accountability that led to the development of personal integrity, a drop in impulsive action, and a sense of social responsibility. Mm. And remember, at this time period, this is all done with consenting hardcore adults. Yes, it is. That is the that is key. At the very top of this, there was a kind of an edge to it that did seem to be helpful. Like, right. there was a little bit of it. But, it, you know. Because obviously we're discussing the troubled teen industry. Yes. yes. And this is adults. Because okay. the idea is that you might think twice about doing something shitty if you knew that you'd be publicly balled out during a game session for doing that shitty thing. Gotcha. And by Diedrich's reckoning, drug addicts couldn't hide anything if they expected to be clean because secrecy was the root of their addiction. I mean, it's it's a simplification, but yeah. I guess. Well, no, I mean, that's the thing is that the game and Synanon worked for some people just like AA works for some people. Sure. I mean, yeah. I'm just saying when I think of drug addicts, I don't think of secrecy because you see them no, in the New York. All they do is run their mouth. They're talking yeah. or like <laughs> kind of falling over, but also not. But it's that's the, what the Twin Towers needed. Heroin. <laughs> have you ever seen? Yeah, so it could have just been. They should have had just, one entire floor just full of heroin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah like, nah, yeah. Nah, back up just fine. But yeah. you know what they're not being honest with is anybody but themselves. Oh. Mm. Well, that's the thing is it, it's Synodon is someone, it's a program for people who do keep it a secret. And they need to talk. To and they need yes, to talk. They Great. need to talk. They want to talk. Sure. They want, they are actively asking for this. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And people who participated, they said they felt invigorated afterward. Their behavior, some people, it changed significantly. Great. And as far as how a game session went, they lasted between two and three hours and were comprised of eight to 15 players. And all of this was transposed in an extremely simplified form to the troubled teen industry, to many of the troubled teen schools. Okay. Each player was asked to, quote, run their story which was their cue to open up their life to the other players. Like me, I'm, I'm a fuckable, unstoppable force of nature, right? And everybody yeah. says, Chuck, 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 stop fucking, right? You can leave some ladies in the rest of us. And I was like, all right, I will quit the boobs. <laughs> well, after opening up, the other players confronted lies and weaknesses in a public forum of analytical and humorous gossip. No holds barred. You could attack mm. interpersonal issues, work patterns, emotions, idiosyncrasies, basically any weak spot. Sounds like a Comedy Central roast of an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. honestly, a lot of those, the more lives have been changed insides of roasts <laughs> than have had in most rehab centers, I'm pretty sure. No. Yes, indeed. But the thing, I mean, it is a roast, but it's an uncorked roast. Yeah, it's like, okay. Uncorked roast. <laughs> but, and this is absolutely key, the point of the game was not to attack the person, but to attack the behavior. Hate the sin, not the sinner. Yes. Yeah, exactly. This allowed the target to separate themselves and look at what they were doing rather than absorbing the abuse personally. The problem was that when the game was adapted to troubled teen programs like the Elan School or Straight Inc., no such distinction was made. That subtlety was lost. Oh. In essence, they were handing this fairly complicated and subtle method to emotionally unstable, traumatized teenagers who were usually just looking to transfer the pain they'd received mm. to whoever was next in line. So the drugs aren't the problem. You're the problem. That's yeah. the idea. Yeah. But then uh, uh, you even say that it's complicated and subtle, but w the where it would go. Like, it actually, it was a, it's a different process that I think a lot of other, like, Therapies. Maybe I'm wrong here, but it sounds like it's. Yeah, it started, doesn't sound complicated at all. But it's it sounded, it started complicated and subtle, and actually became more simplified as it went. Well, yeah, like because as they started doing the game more and more, the more abusive it came, as yes. we'll see. Mm. Oh yeah, very much so. But in Synanon, the game, at least in the early days, it was described as an emotional dance. It was a dream that could either be a nightmare or a pleasant experience. You know, and I realized. Mm. There's no word for a good dream. Yeah, there this is. is. Nightmare. That's yeah, one word. Yeah, what's a word for a pleasant dream? There isn't one. Yeah, there is. What is it? Euphoria. That's mm. not, but that's not a... That that's the be... name of a TV show where uh, teens are doing what about, naughty things. Um, no, there's got to be something. Dream. There's not. 
A uh, pleasant dream. A pleasant dream. A pleasant dream. Pleasant dream. Yeah, I guess you just say pleasant dream. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Good it's dream. Nice dream. That's how. That's how very few times a nice dream happens. Mm-hmm. That's right. Isn't yeah. that? Isn't that? I true? only and have isn't that my, I had a dream I couldn't stand up. Hmm. Wow. I was going through a lot of uh, knee pains because the because the weather. Oh, ah. the rain. Well, the so rain. You, so you, just sat, you just sat in a chair in your dream? No, I was trying to stand up and fight people, but I couldn't stand up. That's really sad. That's, sad. <laughs> That's hard. My knees were hurting. Wow. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yes, indeed. Interesting. Move on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I had a dream last night that I was being choked in a garage full of silver balloons. Buddy, that wasn't a dream. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, dude, that happened, man. Yeah, we were there. Oh, sorry, dude. Sorry. Oh. Yeah. yeah, we fucked you up real good, dude. We hired a task rabbit. Oh. <laughs> yeah, he was so good. Yeah. I give him four stars, though, because yeah. Yeah. five stars is something special. He was actually yeah. dressed as a huge rabbit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Well, I thought it was just the the. the Henry and I are doing our own CIA. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of we're just, we're yeah. psyoping yeah, you. Know, you? Cool. Yeah, you don't know that yet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We just blew the cover. I mean, but he'll forget. I'll forget. Yeah, that's the thing. You just say the magic word and it'll just... Just go back and say like Peabody and then I'm done. Artichoke. Ah. So in other words, it was <laughs> nailed it. Wink. In other words, it was something far too complex and sensitive to be directed by sociopaths and or traumatized teens. Because sometimes it was both. Mm. But one thing that both the game and the troubled teen attack therapies like Alon School's general meetings shared was the use of extreme profanity. It's kind of fun. Deidre yeah. believed that the use of obscenity and blasphemy helped lower inhibitions, which can be fun if it's all adults. But when it's used by teens, it's usually just a bunch of fucks strung right. together with no real structure or purpose. I feel like I used more curse words in a general sense when I was younger, but Absolutely. now I like to use them more and I use them more effectively. Yeah, Absolutely. Pointed. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Come. <laughs> Come. Which is technically See, not even a curse word. It's not, but it's not, but you made me laugh. Yeah, it's that easy. Yeah. I know. I used to just say full sentences that were all curse all words, curse but words. you could understand when I was like, "Get that fucking bullshit out of my goddamn Cock asshole!" And ass and fuck. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's basically what happened. Right now, the game wasn't the only method taken from Synanon. Like the Alon schools, new Synanon residents had to break outside relations for the first ninety days. This first step. Yeah, that's bad. Mm. Although that could be extended to a year if those outside relations were deemed detrimental. Well, that's the first thing that is a red flag to me. Oh, yeah. And similarly, anything that might distract the addict was taken away. For example, Synanon was extremely popular amongst the jazz community (laughs) because uh, heroin was very popular amongst the jazz community. It's how you get relaxed. It makes sense. (laughs) So most jazz musicians were barred from playing instruments or singing for the first part of their stay at a Synanon Center. I actually want to thank Synanon for saving my favorite bar on Friday nights. Jazz night has been canceled. (laughs) (laughs) But it's kind of fun, though. But it is sad to have a room where specifically no saxophones are allowed. Yeah, Yeah, that is weird. No, yeah. That is weird. No saxophones. Not not a single saxophone. But it's specifically pointedly no saxophones or trumpets. I mean, that's also, again, if you're bringing, I feel like saxophone's more friendly. If you're bringing <laughs> really? a trumpet to a meeting, it sounds like you're trying to disrupt something. I yeah, feel that's like a, true. I feel like a trumpet is friendlier. I feel like a saxophone is a very aggressive instrument. No, because you but can I play the just, sax, and the sax can sound beautiful alone. A trumpet is just... <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I just have those associations because of the saxophone guy that used to be on the L train. Yeah, pay me to stop. Yeah, pay me to stop. Yeah. yeah. And that was back when it was fun. Back when it was fun. Yes. But all of this, these are the seeds of the cult-like behavior that Synanon would eventually fall prey to. Another was the institution of something nonsensically called Ramadula. He just, I feel like because the... It will become Sounds a pattern. like a name that, from the water boy. <laughs> Ramadula? Ramadula. You hanging out there with them Ramadula man and go down there and play for no hobo Ramadula man. <laughs> uh, but Chuck Dieterich loved the sound of his own voice, right? Yeah. And he was constantly improving these monologues. And people would go like, this kind of started early and then just got worse and worse and worse as, as it went. Uh, but it does sound like it's, a lot of people adopted his little pet sayings and that they became official terminology for the club. I mean, fuck, dude. Literally, fuck. We all say that sentence that he created. You yeah. know, this is the oh, first yeah. day of your rest of your life. No, that he, is, was, he was a quote machine. Wow. I mean, that's pretty incredible, to be honest. Well, in Ramadula, 
Synanon members had to act unnaturally upbeat no matter what they were doing, and visitors Ugh. often described being met with an unsettling sea of smiles Ugh. at Synanon facilities. It's what he took that. from AA, which is uh, act as if, mm. you know, act as if you were the person you wanted to be, like the idea of you fake it till you make it. Yeah, yeah but why would you want to be a smiling buffoon all the time? Because that's I don't not know. the right emotion for 90% of life. But straight up, Chuck Diederich said that I want you to be so busy when I look at you, you're nothing but a blur of teeth and, and pink. Oh, sounds like my manager at Wendy's. Yeah. <laughs> That's what your manager at Wendy's said that you wanted to be a bl she wanted you to be a blur of teeth and pink. If you got time to lean, you yeah, got time, time to clean. clean. Actually, nah. leaning doesn't take a lot of time. No, it, it really doesn't. doesn't. You really get, will not let go if you got the time to lean, you got time to clean. It's, it's the most offensive thing that has ever been said to him. <laughs> I've worked at eight fast food restaurants. Every time I got a fine for breaking the law. I had to go pay it off, and I had to go to a fast food job. <laughs> 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 well, Synanon, they actually got a lot of positive attention in their early days, and some of it was oddly prophetic. A senator named Thomas Dodd declared that Synanon could, quote, lead the way in the future to an effective treatment for not only drug addicts, but also criminals and juvenile delinquents. Senators immediately looking to find mm. a... Because they just want a one-stop shop where it's like, great, we'll take these troubled people, we'll fucking put them in a room, boom, done, they're done, they're fixed, boom, back in the workforce. Like, yeah. they well, just don't give a shit. They don't care. They just think see, that they can do it fast. To, to be honest, though, it seems more sympathetic than the war on drugs. Oh, it's very much. At the very least, they're yeah. like, well, let's not incarcerate them, let's go to meetings. I mean, no, I, sure, I, I can see this actually yes. if... Well, obviously, because it's going to spiral out of control. But if, it's, <laughs> if it stays good, it's, it could have been something it, good. It just yeah, it could have been. to be that it never does. No, it doesn't. <laughs> well, it's ego. It's always egos getting out of control. It's why Jim Jones and Chuck Diedrich are very similar because uh, they're men who start off with good intentions. That I do believe they do have good good intentions at first. Uh, with you know, with Jim Jones, it was racial equality. With Chuck mm -hmm. Diedrich, it's you know, it's treatment of addicts. Um, but at one point. Either they get bored or their ego gets fed. Their ego just gets too fat and they just lose it. And then when you when substances come into play with Jim Jones, it was amphetamines with Chuck Diedrich. It's going to be the relapse of alcoholism. Yeah, it just sp spins out of control and yeah. just things and things get real fucking weird. I'm trying to think of anyone has started anything with bad intentions and ironically, it turned out to be good. Uh, it's kind of interesting that most things people do think they're doing good and then it turns bad. That's why we have that whole uh, the saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Mm -hmm. I feel like, um, I mean, we developed a whole series of drones to go blow people up and now they make incredible cheap shots in our favorite superhero movies. <laughs> That's worth it. Yeah. It's worth go. a 20-year war yeah. plus the next 1,000-year yeah. war we're about uh, to have. That's pretty good. Yeah. We got those cool shots and smile. Hey, man, think about oh, that. Oh, really cool. They lent <laughs> Tom yeah. Cruise. They, they lent that slave owner full jets <laughs> to Big just jets. fly around that's in the true. sky. It's incredible. Yeah. That we did. And now, now there are movies and we like it, but before <laughs> they were being used to strafe like civilians. Yeah. That, okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, a little like Scientology, Synanon attracted a fair amount of attention from the entertainment business. Besides the aforementioned jazz musicians, a feature film based on Synanon's founding called Synanon mm. was released in 1965, co-starring Eartha Kitt in Whoa. a supporting role as Chuck Diedrich's wife, Betty. Let's play a little oh bit of the God. trailer. Please, can we see Eartha Kitt? Yes. Oh, yeah. The most beautiful woman that's ever beautiful. lived. Oh, yeah. She's incredible. Rawr. She's always my cat woman. Rawr. Synanon is a real corporation. Its business is junkies. Chuck Diedrich is the ex-drunk who dreamed it up and fights to keep it from becoming a nightmare. Nice. Get out of that car and shut up. Stand over there. Put your hands against the wall. Get in that cell and stay there. But nobody tells me what to do. <laughs> then, the ex-con with do? the killer's fist tensed so tight for a fix they bleed. Look, Betty, I don't make scenes with chicks because I've got other things on my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Doll face with a deadly, expensive appetite. <sighs> what are you, my nurse? No, just another dope fame. Just another dope fame. Thank you. A hip hop head. Up from the gutter to grab anything he could get. Cool. Yeah. And Zanky doesn't make it, by the way. Yeah, Zanky's yeah. not going anywhere. <laughs> wow, you could almost hear the big fat tie and suspenders. No, it's cool, because again, 
talk about a movie that at least everybody who's in it looks horrible. <laughs> Do they? You know, there's <laughs> a horrible Earth school. Kid. Well, no, the guy not Earth, 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 Earth Kid. Kid looks great. Yeah. But Chuck Dieterick is like played by. It's so nice to have him not played by like. Joaquin Phoenix. Oh, I <laughs> like know. it's just like a fat, ugly guy playing yeah. a fat, ugly guy. It's revelatory. Yeah. I mean, I loved, uh, I loved the dude who played Penguin. He did a great job. But they oh, could have, they could have. Danny just, DeVito. You know, no, Colin Farrell. Colin Farrell. Oh, that's right. They could yeah. also just hire hire an ugly actor every now and again. It's hard, man. Ugly yeah. actors are to fucking, be honest. A lot of times they're guilty of crimes. <laughs> the person who should have played yeah. the Penguin, who truly seems evil, judging by all of his stories, is Joey Diaz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, yes, he's guilty yeah. of kidnapping. Yeah, you think about the ugly actors that would be good to play in Penguin that's also a criminal. Jeffrey Jones. Jeffrey Jones oh, as yeah. well. Actual criminal. Oh, actual criminal. Play. Yeah, he's exactly. The, he's the Hire principal. criminals to play criminals, please. <laughs> Representation. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, within 10 years of its founding, right around the time that the Synanon movie was released in theaters, Chuck Diedrich's unlicensed rehab startup had 1,100 members and was getting $2.5 million a year in donations. Yeah. Wow. It owns $7 million in real estate in five states. It had its own merch business, and it ran a number of gas stations. He learned that from Scientology is that you buy in real estate. Yeah. He actually is a better businessman than all of Adult Swim. Yeah. They, <laughs> they actually have merch. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I mean, that's the thing. You say sci- he learned it from Scientology. I don't think he did because yeah. Scientology and Synanon ran parallel to each other. Maybe it's because he was were... an executive already. He had started as working for, he was working for a big corporation and then he just understood like, oh, I just use that structure. Yeah, I think he's just smart. You yeah. know, like there's some, a good idea is a good idea. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. Now, partly, Synanon had gotten so cash rich because it had opened its ranks to non-addicts in the late 60s because Diedrich figured that anyone could benefit from the game and... Not addicts. They got a lot more money than drug addicts. You got one foot shorter than the other. You got one leg shorter than the other. You we're going to have to tug on that leg. <laughs> yeah, we're <laughs> Allegorically. <laughs> I just feel like if you don't have a problem, why would you go to this? <laughs> it's, well, it's because, again, we're going to get into it. It's about building and understanding community. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, these non-addict Synanon members were called squares. And once they joined, Chuck Diedrich realized that people shouldn't, quote unquote, graduate from Synanon mm-hmm. anymore. Oh. Used to be, you could graduate from Synanon. Yeah, they, Go it form your own. Be, be a seed in the world. It was supposed to correct you and help you and then right. it'll release you. But then he is like, he realized, oh. what was the quote? He realized that um, you can't graduate a religion. Yeah. But he's not quite to that point yeah, yet. We'll, look at that. well yeah. that's the beginning of a cult. Yeah. Well, he realizes at this point that Synanon can become a lifelong commitment. Why let people go? Yeah, this is like what happens when they allow you to graduate with a master's in sociology and your only profession is being a teacher. Mm. (laughs) It's hard. Now, predictably, once Synanon became a long-term thing and more people with money joined, Chuck Diedrich began building compounds. And by Uh 1971, and this is what I'm talking about, the largest cult you've never heard of, almost 2,000 people lived in Synanon facilities, mostly here in California. Wow. Yeah. Um, good, thing was Janet, good thing Janet Reno wasn't around then. <laughs> she would have had a, a field day killing all of them. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, consequently, Chuck Diedrich and Synanon became more controlling and militant in the late 60s and early 70s. In 1971, for example, Diedrich tried putting some uppity dope fiends in their place with an act that was later called the Dirty Double Dozen. <laughs> oh, baby. He's really good I've with the seen that. <laughs> Dirty Double oh, Dozen. Oh, man, that sounds like a great, like, it sounds like a great donut shop in Portland. Sounds oh, like a- I, I was just, all I heard was Bukaki. <laughs> yeah. That's all I there. saw in my head was I just, Bukaki. I just thought it were like really unhealthy donuts. Yeah, but I like really see, good donuts. There's a difference between us. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta take a break. <laughs> I could see that being like a special every Thursday at Burger King, the Dirty Double Dozen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I could see that. Yeah. So burgers, donuts, come. <laughs> that's <laughs> about the show. <laughs> yep, that's, a, that's the show. That nails it. <laughs> Well, after ordering 22 dope fiend old timers and two young squares onto a Synanon bus, they dubbed the Cine Cruiser. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Honestly, <laughs> also, that's it was, actually cool. It was cool. a Greyhound bus that they bought. It's like, that's the Cine Cruiser. It's Paul, sweet, though. Paul yeah. Morantz also hits it a lot with the term jitney. Jitney? He kept calling it a jitney. Okay. And then actually, Chuck Dieterich went as far as to say is that the bus, the Cine Cruiser, was the second most important element. Of Synanon, other than him. <laughs> he 
wow. loved his bus. <laughs> so L. Ron Hubbard had the cr- had sea the craft, had the yeah. boat, and he's got the Santa Cruiser. He's got the Santa Cruiser. Okay. But, but the Santa Cruiser is very uh, necessary yeah. because their two biggest um, their two biggest compounds are in Santa Monica and in Marin County. Like right it's north of San Francisco. Yeah. So, you know, they're like about 400 miles apart from each other. Yeah, it's like five and a half hour drive. Yeah. You're putting on the bus. Zip, zip, zip. Back oh, home. man. Mm-hmm. Being on a bus with a bunch of people who are recovering drug addicts. I mean, it is just a greyhound. We were singing songs. Yeah. But that's the thing is that they actually no total silence on this trip. Oh, hey, yeah. My total God, silence from Santa Monica to Marin County. Oh. Actually, maybe that's best. <laughs> now that I think about it. If I was a passenger... I, maybe silence is Well, best. mandatory silence is definitely better than mandatory singing. Yes. <laughs> like, that is for certain. I yeah. agree. Well, the double dozen, once they arrived, they had all of their possessions taken away. And they were then verbally attacked Great. in a special game featuring Diedrich, his wife Betty, the one that's played by Eartha Kitt. Oh. It was also the synonym director of the board and an attorney square. And amongst the indictments were skimming community supplies and smoking. <gasps> Which were two things that were newly banned in Synanon because it used to be smoking was almost mandatory. They sent, they actually spent something like seventy thousand dollars a year in, on cigarettes. Oh yeah, man, this is back when cigarettes were good for your teeth. Yeah, and you this can't... was back when cigarettes were like a dime a pack, and they're mm. still spending like sixty grand a year. You can't on just smokes. you can't pull the rug out like that though. Yeah, you have well, to give because well, you Chuck, gotta wean them off the cigarettes. It was all because Chuck Diederich had just stopped smoking cigarettes, which yeah. becomes oh. a theme. And every single mm-hmm. time he decides he wants to do something, the the whole group either says, oh, that's a great idea, or Chuck Diederich has sort of like hinted, this would be a great idea for you all to say that this is a great idea. No, yeah. that sucks. And then it becomes a law. I see. In addition, the Double Dozen was also accused of not playing the game enough, which is basically you're not as invested in the cult as you need to be, and also impregnating two other residents. So that, that one's kind of serious. You're, you're not supposed to do that. Not supposed to do that. No, no yeah, okay. this is also a weird strain. Yeah. And so after over a hundred confessions were made during dozens of games, the dirty double dozen were made to shave their heads as contrition, Uh as was the Senate on custom. Oh, yes. Why is that? You know, when it comes to uh, certain religious beliefs, the hair is so important. I mean, obviously, you go to prison. The first thing they do, shave that Mm -hmm. dome off military. It really does change you, doesn't it? It does. You look at uh, the same thing. We talk about with Heaven's Gate that we joke about the haircuts and stuff on that on that episode. But again, it's about creating a unified identity so that everybody looks yep. exactly the same. And uh, at the very beginning of that, I will listen to a, the first couple episodes of that, uh, the, 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 the show about Synanon. I, forget, mm-hmm. I think it was called The Sunshine Place or whatever. And it was like, because it was from two kids that were grazed in it. Yeah. And mm-hmm. one of them were saying like, it is just wild to see your, like once you get your head shaved and you're like, oh, I don't look like me anymore. Right. Yeah. And that's why Ben Kissel's cult bush hair. A oh, big old bush. It's got very specific rules but, and standards for your bush hair. Yes, because then you go around with a ruler mm-hmm. to measure the level of bush hair. I mean, uh-huh. like, you need to actually be taking more keratin. This <laughs> mound could be an inch higher. <laughs> but that's the thing. What if you're... That's the thing. Everyone's got different curlies. And everyone's got different thickness in their curlies. Technically, I have a lot of bush hair, but it's almost translucent. Yeah. And that's the thing. I we got a lot of bush like, hairs. Yeah, but I got really thick. Like, I got, I got bush hair like a fuck. Fucking, like a thorn bush. Yeah, you know. Yep. Well, that's a lot. I'm just glad Fernando's here in the room. <laughs> I'm glad he knows. I'm glad he knows that we're all. It's, it's good. He bro. knows. He knows. It's good for the company. Yeah. Absolutely. But while the act of shaving one's head started off as contrition, everyone was eventually contrite so often that almost all Synanon members just kept their head shaved. Mm. In fact, so many people in Synanon had shaved heads that George Lucas used a Synanon chapter as bald, futuristic, dystopian extras in his first movie, THX 1138. You know things are going wrong when you're just cast as a dystopian nightmare race. <laughs> right, all right, so you guys, you guys are all a bunch of like, you know, like slaves to a godhead, right? Like, yeah. great, perfect. Stand over here. Like, yeah, 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 no yeah, makeup like, needed yeah, today. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Now, at one point, Synanon did dip their toe into the troubled teen industry, but once they did so, it was the beginning of the end of the good times for the soon-to-be cult. That fast. Yeah. Mm. See, during the 60s and 70s, Synanon coordinated with the San Francisco and Oakland police departments to see if they could adapt the game to help juvenile offenders. This had come about because Synanon had previously hosted games between police and felons in order to improve relations between them. And at one point, (laughs) they had put on a very tense game between Oakland police and the local chapter 
of the Black Panthers. Ooh, that man. must have been really Ooh. fun. That must have been a great the, game of laser tag. The energy in that room <laughs> must wow. have just been Whoa. out of control. <laughs> wow, what a game of dodgeball. <laughs> But since it seems like those games yielded positive results, Synanon okay. took 49 adult criminals in an experiment that was overseen by California State University, and they began gaming them. Hmm. Surprisingly, the program led to positive successes for 38 out of those 49 people. Okay. So they figured if it worked for adults, it must work for kids. Yeah. So a Synanon supporter named Donald Cressy, who was actually a sociologist and a criminologist, he worked with Synanon on what they called the punk squad. This is just, again, because adults can understand yeah. that you're making fun of me. And like, and I'm I'm like owning it, right? Like you can call an adult a dope fiend and they can understand the vague sense of irony that's kind of like attached to oh, okay. it. Okay, you they, got you, me. Yeah, yeah, all right, yeah. yeah. But kids don't. Yeah. Like I, on some level, it's very difficult. I mean, like, yeah, they do, but it's like it it gets in there. Like it yeah. fucks with a bunch of you yeah. call them a bunch of punks, and like that's what you do, and we're like, you're yeah, you're some troubled kid. We're gonna fucking straighten you out and shit. I it feels like maybe I'm wrong, but it seems that kids don't really respond to that as well. They no, don't. Most don't. I certainly didn't. That's no. for sure. No, they internalize it and uh it becomes trauma and they become what you tell them they are. I think so. Yeah, I used to get called a really cool kid. Yeah, that's why, look at him, man. <laughs> yeah. That's why he rode up here on a motorcycle, but what's weird is the engine wasn't going. Yeah. And I was like, how you I doing, man? He just feet. walked in with your feet. I was like, that's how economical. <laughs> cool kid. Now, in complete contradiction to everything Synanon previously believed, none of the kids in the punk squad were in the program voluntarily, mm. which was a key component for the game to work. You got to want to be. Yeah, here. otherwise you just got fucking forced into a room where everyone screams horrible things at you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And additionally, the punk squad used physical force for the first time in Synanon's history because Synanon leaders decided the punks needed to be pushed to the ground by the chest when necessary if they didn't listen or participate. Well, and again, it seems like kids. we are escalating quickly here. Yeah. Very quickly. And these kids are not there on, on their, uh, their own will, right? So they don't particularly understand. They are prisoners there in a way. Yeah. And so, yeah, they're not really responding to the game the right. way you want them to. So instead of you just kind of understanding and leaving room for that, yes, they just started like mushing their faces into the ground. Yeah, they're juvenile delinquents. Right. Like, they don't want to do your stupid little fucking game. Also, they were probably right. Because of the 60s <laughs> and 70s. And they're just like, seeing through the shit, just being yeah. like, y'all know that this is bad, right? That you know yeah. this is going to go south. You don't want to go fight the Viet Cong on the name of <laughs> democracy? Yeah. You don't want to do that? It's like, no, dude, I don't. <laughs> yeah, you're a punk. I, it really feels like I should just stay home. You're a punk. <laughs> Well, treated as second-class citizens within the already rigid Synanon hierarchy, punks had to sit in the back of the bus, hold doors open for non-punks, address every non-punk as sir or ma'am. They had to wake up at 4 a.m. every day, and they were required to smile at all times. I need a little bit. I need a little bit. Rungaloo, right? Ringaloo? Rungading? Ramadoo. Ramadoo. The force to smile thing is so nefarious to me. Oh, yeah. it is. So yeah, because it's thought it is literally trying to control the inner life of any one human being. And I would assume like, if they weren't smiling, then some jackass would be like, where's your smile? Yeah, yeah. you get called out. Yeah. Scream at you and you probably get pushed to the ground if you right. refuse to smile. But one punk who was only nine when he was put through the nine? program, nine mm -hmm. years old, he said that he was forced to run two miles as a punishment, but ran out of breath less than a quarter of the way in. By his memory, he was shouted at, punched, and kicked in the butt by a punk squad coordinator. Jesus. They called the coordinators, they called them ramrods. Yeah, the ramrods. Well, that is not even a euphemism. <laughs> well, that they, is again, a it's all these weird names. Ramrod. And, ramrod, yeah. And of course, as soon as corporal punishment and physical intimidation was used on the punk squad with the kids, it slowly seeped into the rest of the community. It was a slippery uh -oh. slope. And that's where things started going very wrong for Synanon. It's like a multi-level marketing scheme, but just with violence. Mm -hmm. Just with violence. Now, once Synanon began admitting so-called squares into the program, things became more cult-like. And the adult members of Synanon began subjecting their children, sometimes as young as three years old, to the game. What? Now, in the early what days... The, wait, hold on a second. What the fuck could a three-year-old be accused of? <laughs> I don't like, know. Like, literally, what it's does again, a three-year-old do that's purposely wrong? It's, yeah. it's, it's really difficult to kind of like... It's, it's weird, because in some ways, they treated kids like... They, it, they, we talked about this in the last episode, but something about them not being people. Yeah. Right, like they're these little robots. There's these things that we can just make them and break them, and we do whatever it is that we want with them. And that that a three year old 
like it does not we just don't the, the, no leaving no room for the fact that these brains develop yeah. right. and that there are changing and then the sea of like hormones all these bodies are like these things are happening again you're three you just started it's very difficult to have a lot of baggage at right. three and if you do <laughs> a lot of times it's because you've already been a soldier for two years like in some other country yeah right which is very difficult to find the, the helmets that small oh i've seen baby soldiers yeah uh, now in the early days of the squares the early 70s children of synanon members reported more or less positive experiences with the game when it was complicated basically mm. and you took your time with it but in later years when things got a little looser Children found it traumatizing. And this was the game being led by fucking experts. When interviewed as adults, many of these people said that children were nowhere near the appropriate level of maturity for the game. And most of them incurred emotional damage because they couldn't play it correctly. It's like asking a 10-year-old who usually only plays Fortnite to beat Dark Souls. And when they can't do it, you call him a dirty cocksucker. Actually, I think in that way, you might be right. I think that it's because you should force the child to understand <laughs> that video games are important. And that they need to get their shit together, right? Yeah. Because, you know, because now video games are money. You yeah, can be a professional video game player. So that you sit true. there and you one day you said that we'll have our adopted children and you'll look down at them and you'll force them to run Dark Souls again over, and over, again over, and over and over again. Do a speed run. Yeah, yeah that's we'll a good get idea. you good at this. Yeah. Not to, don't tell them that you just run past the asylum demon the first time. No. Don't tell them that. No, because see, see if that little fucker can beat the asylum fuck demon with the broken sword. Fuck him. Fuck, fuck him. fuck him. Fuck him. Fuck him. These games are too hard these days. <laughs> I'm trying to play Callisto Protocol, man. I, I'm playing it on minimum security and I can't play it and I'm done now. No, I want to know too hard. Go back, try to play some Mega Man. Then you'll see I don't want to fucking heart. play Mega Man. Also, isn't he a woman? <laughs> <laughs> Which one's no. the woman? Metroid. You're Metroid. thinking of Samus Aran. Metroid. 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 That's Metroid. No, okay. Kids need to be reading the damn <laughs> encyclopedia. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, speaking of kids, Synanon also had a fair amount of child abuse accusations. Not sexual, but physical. Yeah, it seems like it. Yeah, it's like yeah. when a 15-year-old runaway said in court that she'd been forced to clean up pig manure with carrot sticks as a disciplinary measure. Okay, yeah. I mean, so we're going to be eating that in 2030, so. <laughs> it's not, yeah, that's going to be a luxury. Ooh, pig manure with carrot sticks. Mm. Mm. What kind of hummus Animal is matter? This is incredible. Wow. From your grave. Did you know that property crimes like burglaries and package thefts spike over the winter? That's why now is the best time to secure your home with award-winning home security from Simply Safe. Simply Safe is whole home security with advanced sensors for every room, window, and door, and even hazard sensors that detect fires, floods, and other threats to your home. 24/7 professional monitoring service costs under one dollar a day, less than half the price of ADT's professionally in installed system. Stay in control of your system anytime, anywhere with the top rated Simply Safe app. Here at Last Podcast on the Left, we love Simply Safe. We know our studio is going to be protected from all things evil. Customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash LPOTL. Go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off your order with interactive monitoring. That's Simply Safe dot com slash lpotl there's no safe like simply safe now as far as the game itself went it too took on a different structure in the 70s where before anyone could say anything in the game and not be punished that was sort of the point of it you could now be disciplined for what you said in the game this oh, is why now, would you tell the truth then the, the whole point is again oh. it's starting to create this system this like it's eat your own tail system where no matter what you're guilty and you're guilty and you're guilty and right. so you're forced to be in the, you're forced you're forced to like no you haven't changed yet you're not done yeah. yet you're not done yeah and because you could be disciplined outside of the game for things that you said in the game players stop being honest of course and the entire the therapeutic benefits of the game were completely lost the yeah. whole thing fell apart from here and Chuck Diedrich also began recording game sessions and sending on meetings uh -oh. with the supposed idea that it would make everything open to everyone. But in reality, it gave Chuck Diedrich the ability to keep tabs on what everyone was saying and doing. Right. And it was a further bad idea because those game sessions and meetings would later be used in court in various attempted murder trials. Ah, oh, it's like he's collecting evidence. Well, yeah. he did it accidentally at first and then realized that he can use it against everyone. It's another way to keep everybody in. Yeah. Leverage. But it was... Compromat. <laughs> But it was also nearly impossible to understand the context of everything being said in those recorded games because the game itself had become so Byzantine and varied. It had become both more complicated 
and simplified at the same time because there were different kinds of games. It seems everyone like everyone just made it up themselves, which makes it extremely complicated. Yes, yeah. again, you're just everybody's everybody's running train on it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. I'm sorry, I was just thinking about the story of the one cop that the was cop, blowing all the dudes. The cop, the, the that, was, cop that was fucking all the other cops yeah. inside of the station while on duty. The, the cop blowbang. Yeah. yeah. You know about this, Ben, right? I don't. Have you heard about this? Have you heard about this? this? Have you heard about this? Uh, heard about no, this is one of the stories that must have fallen through my throw I'll send my it to you later. this yeah. week. Thank you'll, you. You'll like it. It's I'll got, love it. It's co- it's cop blowbang. No. I don't know how I missed it. That's all I do all day. <laughs> the Synanon basically had four stages of development. The first and second stage from 1958 till 1968, that was focused on the voluntary rehabilitation of alcoholics and drug addicts. It was there solely as a therapeutic community that made a little bit of money. I mean, just a little bit of money. Well, Well, you need a little cash to keep it going. We're sitting here, we created a proprietary system. Mm -hmm. Okay, a little bit of a proprietary (laughs) system. Okay, you know what I mean, man? You trying to come here, fill in the proprietary system with some more money? I'm fine with it. It was well worth it. I got better. (gasps) Okay. The third stage that lasted from 1969 till 1975, that was focused on building a social movement to create a utopian society. Utopian society. That's going to be great. <laughs> that's going to totally work out. Yeah. And that's in a time when h- many hucksters were trying to do the same. This is when they expanded it out to the squares. And when they expanded it out to the squares, they made a little bit more money. You mean to tell me you're going to be mad at me because I'm bringing in a bunch of extra people? Yes, to my proprietary system. Yes, maybe. I make a little money. Yeah, be mad at me. That's my businessman persona <laughs> inside of me. You're going to be mad. No, yeah. oh, I got to do certain things. I got to make certain choices because this is about it. So we're looking at financial stability here. That's all you got to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. But the fourth stage that began in 1975 and lasted until Synanon disintegrated in the late 80s, that was when they got greedy and began to self-identify as a religion. Oh, yeah. And that eventually became a full-scale charismatic dictatorship run by Chuck Diedrich. Hey, man, Uh-oh. because he realized, hey, if we center it, they did it the old, the, they did it, they came to the L. Ron idea mm-hmm. all the way the backwards way. So the savior, they, the savior of the world is a dude named Chuck. Oh, yeah, buddy. <laughs> okay. Well, Chuck, he doesn't need a whole head. Okay. Well, he's got, <laughs> you remember it. He's a half-headed dude named Chuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's actually the thing about it is that it's a religion, not a religion. You know, it's like there's no gu- there's, to the IRS. This, it is very much a religion. Yeah, I yeah. see. Yeah, they, yeah. But then sending on because that's that was their kind of joke. It's like, <laughs> well, who's God then? I don't know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Must man. be Chuck. <laughs> but then, they, uh, yeah, yeah. But then, they yeah, it does. That. It does become Chuck becomes like God-like, but not God. God. He's God-esque. God-esque. God-ish. Yeah. It's like it's like you know when you Demi-god, go to see a mall maybe. Santa. Yeah, right? it's Santa that's light. not the main Santa. No, he's just like I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm one of the Santa. I'm one of the God's helpers. It's like the, it's like that representative, the guy George Santos, who lied about his entire life. Yes, he's currently the, in office, and mm-hmm. hopefully not for much longer. No, uh, I, he he claimed that he was Jewish, and then yeah. he said, "No, no, no." I said I was Jew. Ish. Yeah. Ish. As yeah. if he liked, he watches Woody Allen movies. But I don't know what that means. That just sounds like a review in a theater in the Upper Jew. West Side. Ish. Ish. Yeah. Does he look like a man that used to be a haunted clock? Like he looks like he was magically changed from being a fat little table clock to being a guy. I agree. There's something wrong with him. That's for sure. It really is. But once the dictatorship came and Synanon, so too did the violence and sexual weirdness that seems to be a specifically California cult phenomenon. It's the sunshine. It's <laughs> yeah, is that right? It's always with the sex and violence out here. I mean, every time I see a mountain, I do see titties. Yeah. yeah that's, no. my, that's my problem. Sierra Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> look at the, look at the <laughs> butt on that <laughs> California. Just kissel out in the middle of the brush, <laughs> just holding on the side of a mountain, licking me like, <laughs> you're giving me the milk. Come on, give me a milk. Where's Whitey Walker? Okay, oh. the sex I get, the, the landscape makes you horny. What about, the, what about the violence? I think he's just lonely. No, <laughs> not the violence. I'm good on violence. I don't have any. Okay. I don't see any violence. No. Where's the violence? Where is the violence? <laughs> Honestly, if you I'm do look at... the Californian cults are among the most violent. Oh, when it comes to that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But where's That's the, our but, brand. But I see the sex comes from... Sex, okay, you're saying that the sex comes from the landscape being horny. It's a horny landscape. It yeah. is. And the violence comes from TV. <laughs> Which we also make. Which Which also also California. Make. Oh, yeah, yeah, it comes back out, uh, comes back around. I see what you mean. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Synanon made a very concerted effort to become a religion, and they did so for practical reasons. Namely, the federal government recognized them as a religion in 1974. No taxes. Uh. Listen, guys, and I'm saying this to our listeners right now. You look at me, look at me dead in the eyes, and you know for a fact, right, that I'm I'm good for it. 
right? <laughs> but when we start this, if you do happen to see a thing where they say last podcast networks a religion, right? I'm going to need all y'all to just roll with it. Yeah, right? Boxes says that. yes. Just yeah. roll with it because no, listen, we're going to give kickbacks to you because guess what I get to do for you? If when we're a religion, guess what you get to be? Forgiven for free. Done. Wow. <laughs> you get to be done. As soon as we go, just listen, you're wow. cool with me. Whatever you've done, I mean, certain things I won't, I can't. You yeah. can't forgive everything. Yeah, but but you're then not just all don't, God. you know what's on you? Don't tell me about those. Boom. <laughs> tell me all the things you want. I forgive you. You're done. It'll be completed. You're fixed. Yeah. Two on, the, two on the nose. Two on the nose. What do you mean? Well, you just said that publicly. No, 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 no. So now I think the government's going to be like, oh, they're scamming us. No, 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 no. I'm going to understand that this is a part of my awakening period. The Great Awakening. Let's oh, see. this is going to go great. <laughs> Well, additionally, being a religion, that meant that they didn't have to be licensed. Oh, yeah. isn't that cool? It's yeah. less regulations, nice. no taxes, even faker bosses, right? Because oh. you went from just being like there is no God to Chuck's God. Yeah. It's just like wow, I you get love, nothing but benefits. I love the government recognizes magic as a reason not to pay taxes. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh. Broken system. Yeah. yeah. But perhaps most importantly, being a religion meant that Synanon was forever. It would eliminate questions like, when does a person graduate from Synanon? Because nobody graduates a religion. When do you graduate Catholicism? The when Pope. you say fuck you, dude. <laughs> you like, become the Pope. You finally you're did it. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, guess, I guess you could technically, you do graduate Buddhism eventually when you leave the Wheel of Karma. That is great. You do graduate Buddhism. But does anybody? But has anybody? Mm -hmm. I want to see some proof. I don't know. Okay? Show me proof you of can... your enlightenment. All right? Send me a postcard from the netherworld. They wouldn't have to do that because they're enlightened and they don't I know, care if you agree or not. That's what's yeah. maddening about Buddhism. Because yeah. they'd be like, oh, I know you don't care, but you do care. You're wearing you're wearing it now. You just handed me the gold card and you're making me give you 10 bucks. I don't know. Either way, you can't. Buddhism. I think you're thinking of Moonies. No, is that Moonies? I think that's Moonies. When the, when the thing where they hand you the card like, just... it's for good luck and then when you go to take it, they pull it back and they're like, give me money. We're just going to say that whatever you're saying is wrong. <laughs> we're just going to cover that base. I don't know what base we're uh, covering. Audience will I'm know. there with but, you. We're, all, yeah. we're, we're here together, me and you. Yeah, when, yes, does yes, my, no. when does my I'm sorry for everything run out? Like never, when I said, no, that I said never that, runs out. I said no, I'm sorry for everything. Out. I don't have to renew that, right? You do. Yeah. You have to. Yes, it's fine. But when? Every, every, you're just every, dead. Think about it like every six months. Like, you know, when you have a medication that you have to be on forever and like once a month they have to like re your re doctor has to reevaluate. Re yeah. So like once a year, yes, you do. You can get it done for the whole year right now if you want. I'm sorry for everything. That's a All whole right. year. See you in 2024. All right, great. Boom. It cool. is 2023, right? It is. Sure. Okay, cool. Yes. And well, around the time that Synanon started calling themselves a religion, shit started getting weird, as it always does. Two years after they got their tax-exempt status, Synanon instituted a policy that members would no longer have children because the world was overpopulated. Yeah. Now, no children wasn't a hard rule, but women were coerced into having abortions more than a couple of times. But eventually, Synanon put the onus of no kids onto the men. Which actually I find... Snip it up. Weirdly... Refreshing. It is refreshing. It's I mean, about it's a, time. It's a great way to get to come on titties, faces, butts, come, come, toes, come, 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 everywhere, everywhere else. Everywhere else, yeah. When but, I mean, it got rough. Yeah. Because in 1977, Synanon required that all members over the age of 18 who had been in Synanon for over five years, everyone's got to get vasectomy. It's a vasectomy. You get a vasectomy. Whoa. You get a vasectomy. Fantastic. Wow. Yeah. It's like being on Oprah. Nah. <laughs> it, it, it's reversible. Yeah, and these vasectomies were performed collectively at so-called clipping parties. I'm going to need a doctor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It can't just yeah. be some I guy. don't want, yeah. yeah. Yeah, over 250 men participated in these clipping parties. And a lot of people, you know, immediately ask, you know, like, what do you bring to a clipping party if you go to one? And I'll tell you what, you bring ice. Ice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And sadly, you can't bring booze. No. Oh, all yeah. of this is all sober. If and when I go and get my, because I, I might do that. You, you can't show up drunk, right? Like, do they know me? Yeah. Well, you don't want the. Blood. I can't do one final like, all right, and like come out, like do one big come you out. Still come. Yeah, you yeah still I know, come but like come with just no come with living squids. Yeah, right. No. If I like, come a couple of living squids, they'd be like, whoa, like Graham Parsons when he partied really <laughs> hard before that, he, but, he, but he died. Yeah. I think you'll die though because it thins your blood. Yeah. So you, you want to be careful. You don't want to have. You don't want to be super hammered during surgery. Okay, no. cool. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. No, not After, not super hammered. Because I'm glad Kissel told me. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this naturally led to a mass exodus of members. Not everyone wanted to get clipped. Yeah, I could see that. One member said, quote, Hey, uh, I'll give you my life, Chuck, 
but not my balls. <laughs> <laughs> that's how much men love their balls. Yes, yeah. I, mean, I will seriously. die, but if you touch my nuts. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like, that's my cum. Yeah. Yeah. But things got weird again in April of 1977 when Chuck Diedrich's wife, Betty, died of lung cancer at the age of 55. One Ooh. day we'll do a, an Oscar-style memoriam to all of the wives of cult leaders <laughs> that died that allowed the cult then spin wildly out of control. Yeah. It has happened time and time again. Yeah. They always have some form of stabilizing influence that vaguely keeps them in pocket Mm -hmm. for a certain period of time. And then as soon as that's gone, it's just like... All right, mm-hmm. fucking yeah. finally, the rice can play. <laughs> well, look, look what happened with George Lucas. If he stood, would have stayed married, we never would have had Jar Jar Binks. Yeah, his wife created Star Wars. Yeah, well, she, yeah, she did the edits and all the stuff in the script. and all the things that mattered. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because then when you watch the ones that didn't have her editing, you're like, why is that there? Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah, she said, give the Wookiee hair. Don't make the Wookiee a space owl. Man, he's stupid. <laughs> Man, George Lucas was just kind of just shows that all you have to do is be accidentally right once. Kind of. That's yeah. it. Yeah. That's why Warren Buffett says, as you said about billionaires, he's like, you only got to make three good decisions a year. And it's just like, what does that mean? <laughs> he drinks Coca Cola just like us. I don't think wow. he does. I think it's a little off. No, he drinks Coca Cola just like us. He lives in a house. It's just a house. Just it, like us. I don't understand. Now, so respected was Synanon that the mayor of Los Angeles proclaimed a Betty Diedrich Day to recognize her work in drug rehabilitation when she died. And condolences were sent by Jimmy and Rosalind Carter... Who just can't catch a break when it comes to their associations? Yeah, you know, Jimmy just—he had a Too faith friendly. in everybody. <laughs> yeah, Rosalind between John Wayne Gacy, oh, yeah, and yeah. The, Jim Jones, Jim Jones, and the leader of Synanon. Maybe she wasn't the best judge of character. I, you know what? I'm just gonna blame, and I don't mean this because he's doing it. It seemed like the Carter whole administration. A lot of weird shit happened during that time period. There was. It was a very. The late seventies were an odd time to be an American. It feels kind of similar now. Yeah, yeah, it actually way, does. Ah, yeah. oh, do you feel the malaise? I Don't do. You feel the malaise? I, I do. We malaise. have a skeleton president. Yeah, <laughs> we. Uh, um, there's people Jimmy are Carter scary. Was, but Jimmy Carter was young then. Yeah. Yes. Ish. Yeah. But ish. then, yeah, but he ish. was still kind of a skeleton peanut man. No, that's the thing. Yeah, he had he's, a full head of hair. But he was still skeleton ish. He was just in shape. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but you guys call me skeleton. You guys have called me a skeleton since I was fucking 32. You also like bones more than us. Yeah, it's more of a bone thing. Uh, yeah. Is it more of a bone thing? I always yeah, thought because it was... you saw bone. Like our first gift to patron was you sawing bones. Yeah. Like Henry and I didn't be like, give him bones. You were like, I got a great idea. I got all these bones. <laughs> I saw all these bones. And then you would complain about how it was getting in your lungs. And we'd be like, stop sawing the bones. You'd be like, you got to saw the bones. They're going to stop listening if they don't get the bones. <laughs> you I, don't, I think it was illegal yeah. as well. Well, so where through the mail. Where but. I was doing it was also illegal. Uh, no, not, that helped the no, all you have to do, Don't worry. All you had to do is pay off the health uh, inspector. Isn't <laughs> yeah. that a nice thing to just say out loud? Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's no longer in business. Yeah. So. But that hadn't nothing, that nothing felt right since like about 2015 or so. Things have been weird, yeah. Like, things have been real odd since Yeah, man, no, it's, it, yeah, it's January 2016. That's about the, right before yeah. Bowie died. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, then a lot that, of people things, blame him, yeah. Things have been real weird since then. Oh, yeah. I'm just kind of used to it now, I guess. Yeah, yeah. it's just become, it is now normal, technically, because it's yeah. been seven years. Yeah, yeah. R.I.P. Bowie. We just uh, passed his, uh, his, the anniversary of his death just a couple of days ago. Jesus Christ. Ziggy Stardust. Yeah. yeah. Like, well, you're going to live longer than that because next week you're 40. Yeah. No, Bowie was like in the 70s. Yeah, I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. But he's trying, longer in January. You know? yeah. <laughs> he's trying to be encouraging. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> back, back. <laughs> As for Chuck, though, his wife, Betty, much like Marshall Applewhite's partner, Bonnie Nettles, she was the one who kept him from doing anything too crazy or too sexual. Although she was on board with the vasectomies. <laughs> yeah. Every woman is. Well, yeah. She just wanted not to get pregnant from fucking all the cult members. Yeah. But after Betty died, both the violence and the weirdness at Synanon escalated once again. Oh. At the age of 64, two months after Betty's death, Diedrich decided to remarry. He told reporters, quote, and Look, this is a direct quote. I sent up a flare like any monarch of old times would have done. I let out the word that I was available. <laughs> Um, the girls monitor. came coming looking to see what, what was underneath the belly. And yeah, guess what they found? A tiny little set of dick and balls. Yeah, tiny little dick balls. Four feet above that was the smartest half head that woman <laughs> ever met in her damn life. Well, indeed. Uh, so you think you're a king, you're kind of a monarch, then you're kind of a yeah, king. Or, and do you yeah. have a, who are you a king of? Like, I'm a king what, of this belt. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come kiss the belt. All right, I'll kiss the belt. King of this belt. I like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> King of this damn belt. That's how I feel about all my little mama clothes. I think out of all the cult leaders, Jim Jones would have the best. Oh, oh, Charles Manson would have the best belt buckle. I could see I Charles Manson. He was Manson. mostly belt buckle yeah, when he was I wearing one. I could see him having a belt. Just one day, just be like, hey, man, look at my belt buckle. Yeah, I can oh, see yeah, that. Yeah. But that's the thing is that I think it's it, it's that thing. Like, you know how most porn stars are like tiny and that's why the dicks look so yes, big? Yes, exactly. That's why. It's the, that would be like Charles Manson because he's so tiny, the belt buckle is going to look a lot bigger. That's fine. Optics are everything. Optics are everything. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, six women applied to become Dietrich's wife. Wow. Applied. Oh. But Chuck eventually settled on a 31-year-old teacher at one of Synanon's schools, a woman named Jenny Shoren. Pretty soon after they got married, though, Diedrich declared that marriage should no longer be a permanent institution yeah. amongst <laughs> Synanon <laughs> members. He is the monarch of that belt, dude, because <laughs> wow. he understood. He got married immediately. He's like, there's this thing about getting married. Right? Yeah. Is it it's, they call it an institution for a reason. So I say, we let them out. Let, <laughs> out, the, let out the patients. Mm -hmm. Institutions have doors, I suppose. He told every married couple that they had to split up. And what? form new three year long love matches with new partners plucked from the Synanon membership pool. It's so just he's like, going fucking full crazy. Yeah. It's really interesting. Again, it's just everyone. It's just they all, they, without even knowing that the, all these guys, other cult leaders do this, where he, they all have the same relevatory, like, we need to fuck each other's wives. Yeah, why? <laughs> Actually, why? Like, it's more that I need to fuck all your wives. Right. Because at least he spread the love. Yeah. I don't know. Now, many of these couples had gotten married within Synanon in mass marriage ceremonies. And they'd actually... How romantic. Yes. And they'd actually committed themselves not only to each other, but to Synanon itself in their vows. During these ceremonies, <sighs> men wore overalls and dress shirts, while women wore ankle-length granny dresses and broad brimmed hats. <laughs> Actually, uh, overalls were sort of the Synanon um, uniform because Chuck Diedrich, one day, he's one of those guys that just decided, I just want to wear overalls every day for the rest of my life. And sure, he it. can do that. I'm and wearing sweatpants. I don't ask you guys to wear the same. <laughs> um, so basically, he's like, you bitches look like Diane Keaton. Dudes <laughs> look like someone named Elmer. Yes. He, because yeah. again, he had a real overalls body. Yeah. Now you might decide, what is that? Like, if you've seen magazines, a man in overalls a lot of times really cut. He's about really to hunky. drop it. He's going to show his hog. With one right? little suspender <laughs> yeah. down. Like, but guess nipple. what? Most people in overalls look like Porky Pig. Yeah. And that's <laughs> what he the, looked like. Yeah, because you wear overalls so your pants don't fall <laughs> yes, down when you're idea. farming. <laughs> you yeah. are now want quick access to shit, and you're yeah. sick of dealing with the hassle of all these tight fitting belts and pants. Right. Yeah. And also, they all got married dressed like that. And they got married by a reverend who was riding a Shetland pony. <laughs> <laughs> Why? He's riding on a tiny Why? little pony. Because then you have the majesty of a horse without <laughs> worrying about the em emasculating lack of height that you receive standing next to a man. He's the horse. bad guy from Shrek? <laughs> <laughs> now, since many of these people had been married to and within Senanon, 230 couples agreed to Chuck's switcheroo plan. So 460 legally married people got divorces and hooked up with someone new. Well, what? They, they, they imagine at some point there's somebody who's just like, yes, like, no. yes, this oh, is yeah. the excuse I needed, yes. I'm sure, but I'm sure there's a lot of people who weren't like that. You oh, know, yeah. Uh, who got excluded. Chuck's brother, he didn't have to do it. Everyone else had to do it, but no, Chuck's weird. brother got an exclusion. It's like, I kind of like my wife. Yeah. Wow. yeah he's like, I kind of like, like her. All right, you sure. fucking dweeb. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> But since this is another weird-ass request, Synanon had another huge drop in membership, and they lost 300 members in 1977 alone. They actually lost more people from the marriage thing than they did from the vasectomy thing. I could see that almost. Yeah. Then, right around the same time that shit got weird, shit also started getting violent. Yeah. See, a few years before, Synanon had started stockpiling deadly weapons. God, it's the stockpiling. It's the stockpiling. Yeah. They got 57 shotguns. 24 Colt 45s and 300 thousand rounds of ammunition. Now this transition, like we're doing a little bit of like yada 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 and because bit. it's very difficult to put in this is a there's a lot of complicated shit happened during this time period, but it's just um, it's important for you to know that the shift actually did happen fairly quickly. Yeah. But the, it, Why the did ramp they... up happened, but it started just like 
compounding. It felt very exponential. Like it felt oh, like yeah. once one thing started happening, the next thing started spilling the next. And he was ramping up this talking points because everyone's living in a commune. And so he's talking endlessly all Multiple day. communes. Multiple communes. Yeah. And they're playing the recordings of his speeches. Oh. They're playing them stuff on all these things. He he's got his a, own radio station that he called it The Wire. Yes. That people could listen to it all. It's a good time. name and of a radio station. Is, though. Yeah. He would go the to his bedroom <laughs> and literally start <laughs> monologuing and the whole place was built for sound. So you're just living in Chuck Diederich's head all day. Wow. Mm -hmm. He's oh. He learned from Jim Jones in a way. Again, yeah. I don't know if he did or if it's just again. Nah, it's Jim just, Jones is years later. I think that he's the, I feel like in a way that the he's, Godfather. The, he's the Carlos Mencia. <laughs> And it's Jim Jones is still like the elite, right? Yeah. Why did they feel the need to start stockpiling weapons? Was the government coming after paranoia? Them? Uh, it's paranoia, yeah. Okay. And and I think it's also just a general, you know, getting being plugged into the decade, man. Like, yeah. cause, you know, shit gets real dark starting in the early seventies. You know, right. they're kind of caught up in this whole utopianism type thing, and it's not working out. And nothing's working out. No, in a, for anybody. in a utopia, you don't need to stockpile weapons. No, no not normally. That's no, kind of the whole no. Point of it. But it's it, about but... you, you got to defend your utopia. No, you know? I know because yeah. it's not utopia. Yeah, but, and it's not yeah, because a bunch of people are like, "Hey, you might have developed a system of abuse in there." And I, everything I hear coming out of your little room, right. it sounds shadier and shadier and shadier. The and then he's like, "No, they're it's beginning the persecution complex. They're going to come uh, shut us down because they don't get our lifestyle." Well, I think it's fairly simple. You know that saying, "If it smells like shit everywhere you go." Go check your own shoe. Yeah, you know, I I think Chuck Diedrich was. Wait such a second. What? I think that's actually that. I think, oh my god! Yeah, it, it's Thomas like, Jefferson said that. Yeah. Yes, Thomas Jefferson. I it's love a, that. If you're the type of person who says that says that everyone's an asshole, yeah, yeah, exactly. everyone sucks. You suck. You know, like why? Why is everybody always mad at me? It must be their fault. It's, it's like, everybody no, else's asshole. Like, no, you're the asshole. Yeah. And I think that's what happened with Chuck Diedrich. Chuck, Chuck Diedrich had a way of antagonizing. Everybody around him, especially mm. his neighbors. Well, because they said his issue is truly was the fact that he forgot. He'd spent so long in these synodon groups that he forgot that other people don't talk like that. Yeah. They don't curse and scream and yell at people and, and like <laughs> be a quote unquote straight shooter. And a lot of times I find that when someone calls themselves a straight shooter, again, they mean a fucking insufferable asshole. Massive yeah. asshole. And then it's that where it's like always insulting people and talking all this shit. And so his world is really closing in and yeah. he's becoming way more isolated. And because okay. he's becoming so aggressive, everyone around him is becoming so aggressive. He's getting yeah. what he's putting out. Hence you know? the guns. Exactly. And Chuck Diedrich started getting paranoid about the many splitties. <gasps> that's what he called people who left the program. Oh. And that's another thing is that there's this mass ex these multiple mass exoduses yeah. of um, people and he's thinking like they're all against me. There's no other reason why they wouldn't be down for vasectomies or leaving their wife so they can fuck someone random. Yeah, and group screaming sessions yeah. and everybody getting starting to get physically beaten and, and yeah. moved around and pushed around. Yeah, it's very yeah. Well, pretty much anything bad that happened was blamed on splitties. And eventually that paranoia translated to violence. Mm. Synanon members began assaulting members of their community seemingly at random, including a rancher who bordered their land. He sounds like such a sweet man. His name was Alvin Gambanini. Oh. <laughs> okay, hold on. Alvin First of all, G he does not. He sounds like he's on the lamb. He uh, does. Because there's no... <laughs> yeah, name's uh, Tony G No, Alvin Gambanini. <laughs> Gambanini. <laughs> Nini, uh, uh, I can uh, just see like not Alvin Gambanini. You, you, you like it? You no, like a bunch like of a, it I try to bring a fresh goat. I try to bring a fresh man coat. And this time you tell yeah. me I need to cut my balls. Yeah, the I'm man gonna... I go up to him, I say, oh, I got a nice little push. Oh, this. And he say, yeah. why you come? Was this still a work? No. And I say, I'm a Gambanine. No, Seems he's... like all of your horses don't have heads, Mr. Gambanini. <laughs> Are you sending those to random beds? Sometimes a message must be delivered in a simple <laughs> and direct manner. Yeah. Uh, no, he's going to knock on your door. He's like, hey, I got some good mozzarella. No, he's not. No. All yeah, right. Everybody got to a head of shit. <laughs> Elvin Gambanini. But if That's you not do, the name of a farmer. <laughs> if you do want to know about the real, this fucking, it's crazy. There's he's a bunch not. of fucking shit. Look at the in the and look at the paulmorans.com and go to the true story of sitting on violence and how it started. Mm -hmm. The roll up of him. There's a thing called the siege of Tomales, Jeez. which is what he, they literally took. Cause so as one thing we're yada, yada, yada is that they moved 
right? They moved from Santa Monica and they moved to Riverside. They bought a bunch of complexes, right? They bought a bunch of land. And so once okay. they went, they, they went isolated themselves. These, like, these neighboring towns are like, who the fuck are these people just yeah. rolling in? It was Same like, thing happened with Jonestown. Yes. Yeah, it was a shock to the community, yeah. I would think. Or and not so, Jonestown, with the with People's Temple, when they moved from Indianapolis to uh, California, Northern California, the Redwoods. Yes, yeah. mm. it started with that, right? Because he's doing this, and but the local police department loves him. They're hiring members of Synanon to mm. be like deputies and shit, you know, stuff. But they literally attacked an entire town because they believed that people were trespassing on their land or on the roads. And he would like say, hey, we're going to go out and we're going to attack these people that anybody tries to fuck with us. We need to go on the offensive. And like, we need to show them that we're actually in control of this entire environment. So okay. you have these like a bunch of like malnourished, bald headed people in overalls showing up and like taking over town squares and shit with like broomsticks and shovels. <laughs> like, it's really weird. Well, just take the statues down. I don't care anymore. <laughs> just look up at the Siege of Tamales. It's very siege weird. Siege of it's, Tamales. It's just all very weird. I mean, the way one former Synanon member put it is that, like, Synanon wasn't very good at violence. Like, yes, they were sure. violent, but they weren't very good at it. You I know? can see that. Well, we're just lucky that they were not. Yeah. yeah, we are. We're very lucky they weren't. But, you know, Synanon was also sometimes the target of violence. You know, like residents, Synanon residents said that they were shot at they sometimes. Said. They said. They said. Like, teenagers would try hitting them with their cars. They get, <laughs> they <laughs> said, yes, exactly. Yeah. They were on the street. But this is their this is their extension out. This is the part of the persecutory thing that they said. It was that yeah. everybody hated us. And it was like, no, it's because you showed up. And then you, like, would claim back roads for Synanon. And you yeah. would, like, do this thing and be like, no, this is our road now. And then, like, right. you'd, you'd show up and be like, no, that's my, I've been driving this road for 25 years. It's like, yeah. now you forced us into conflict. Yes. And then yes. you're going to blame me for having to react to you. Yes, yes. yes. exactly. But... Synanon members, they began training with guns and batons, and eventually they created their own martial art to defend themselves. They called it Sindo. Yeah. I'm going to shoot myself. <laughs> yeah, seriously, what you want to do is you want to pin the guy into the table, or you want to get him down into a chair, right? Yeah. And the thing is, you put that fucking TV on, you give her some pizza, and you make him too lazy to fight you back. And then you take that knife, you stick it in between the left ribs and directly in the heart, and he's dead. Oh, wow, the old Jesus death there. Uh, what if I just punch you in the head. You'd have to fucking get the mission half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, from what Diedrich said, he was tired of turning the other cheek, tired of the spineless hippie shit. That's how we put it. Oh. In one case, Synanon members caught a guy siphoning their gas, so they grabbed him, held him down, and shaved off his head and beard. I do like that people who siphon gas see everything as a cup. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Again, Synanon doesn't do violence very well. Yeah. Like to them, that's like, oh, you sh we're shaving his head. We're shaving his oh, beard. Oh, no, it's a hair for hair match. It yeah. is weird, though. It's I, weird. I feel that's like, the thing. They're not good. They're just weird. Well, it feels like dream violence. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It feels because it's, it like, it's a lot of pinning people down. Because, again, I think there's a, they were, it sounds like there were several lawyers that were in the inner group of uh, Synanon. Yeah. And I think we're advising them in many ways, kind of like in a way of like, if we do this, this, and this, this is what we get away with, right? Yeah. Like just pinning somebody to the ground, sure, adults pinning man. another. It's like it's very difficult for people to prosecute these things. Like, like it's very difficult to call it assault, especially yeah. if you're in a town where half the police force is the Synanon members that are pinning the guy down on the ground. Yeah, it seems just juvenile, uh, just it's juvenile weird. enough where yeah. they're like, all right, move on. We got bigger crimes to do to worry about. Well, Synanon. Well, Synanon also built its own security force that they called the Imperial Mar Marines. Yes. No, no, they're not Marines, nor are they Imperial. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't know where the word Imperial came from. I think it's because he's just, again, chucking away. He has his own sense of humor mm -hmm. about how he's the godhead of this group. Yeah. Okay. Well, they began running drills in which all <laughs> residents had to stop what they were doing when they heard the words, Hey, Rube. Hey, Rube. Hey, Rube. I would love to see them run drills. That would be amazing. In the oh, army yeah. now, dude. Bunch of yeah. jazz musicians trying to figure out how to be an army. <laughs> they then had to grab anything they could that could be used as a weapon and come running. That's my uh, dick, dude. Yeah. <laughs> and like Charles Manson, Dietrich became convinced that a race war was coming. Yeah, so it was Well, he called it a holy war. A holy war. But oh, it was the, the subject. Well, the thing is that Synanon was actually integrated uh, at a time. When, so what's the races that are going to be fighting? The other uh, ones outside of Synanon. No, oh, it's okay. everyone in Synanon is going to be cool with each other, but outside it's going to be black versus white. It's the same oh. thing. It's, it's Helter Skelter. 
Great. Yeah, basically. It's going to work out fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And as such, Synanon members began reacting not only to actual attacks, but to anticipated assaults. Yeah, yeah, he's like, he's ramping it up, saying they're coming to get us. It's that. It's the same Jim Jones cycle. Yeah. You got to have that fear, I guess. One former member named Phil Ritter was almost beaten to death by two so-called Imperial Marines in his own driveway. His skull was broken and he was in a coma for a week. Hmm. But that wasn't meant to be a murder. Synanon's next major act of violence, one of the weirdest in cult history, was. See, in 1978, an attorney named Paul Morantz that Henry has mentioned a couple of times already, he became involved with a case in which a woman with mental health problems was referred to Synanon. Without asking her what she wanted, Synanon whisked her away to a facility hundreds of miles away shaved her head, Hmm. and held her there against her will. Probably didn't want that. No. 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 All this was illegal. It took nine days for her husband to find her, and the man who assisted him was Paul Morantz. Mm. Now, Paul Morantz caused a lot of trouble for Synanon, especially because his actions triggered charges of kidnapping, wrongful imprisonment, and practicing medicine without a license. Those were all crimes he was actively doing. Yeah, it was. And also, yeah. and because she was mentally ill, she wasn't an addict. That's how they got the practicing medicine without a license. I thing. think Synanon may have caused their own problems. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just sort of like <laughs> exposed them, maybe. Yeah. But therefore, Chuck Diedrich began to see Paul Morantz as a mortal threat to everything he'd built. Uh-oh. Now, Morantz knew that Diedrich was a dangerous man because he'd heard about the severe beatings and threatening phone calls from Synanon members didn't help matters either. Eventually, Morantz bought a shotgun and started checking his car for bombs every time he got in. Jeez. And as it turned out, Morantz's instincts were correct. Because everyone thought for a while that he was crazy. Yeah. They were like, they're just a group of kooks. This is just a thing. There's like a fad they're or whatever. Help. They're not going to do anything. But he was like, I think these guys are going to kill me. Yeah. I mean, the idea of a car bomb, it's uh, unique. I mean, it happened. Like, really? You think they're going to use a car bomb to kill you? It definitely what? used to happen way more than it used to. I feel like car way. bombs were used to, were like, I know that car bombs were used a lot in the Italian mafia, uh, in the, the troubles, in the Nazi, yeah, in the, the, the troubles in uh, Ireland. Yeah. There's a lot of car bombs. Like good stuff. It's, it eat, is. Eat, you go through the drive through at Taco Bell, you got some friends in the car. Next thing you know, you got car bombs. <laughs> now, that <laughs> is. Old-fashioned humor. That's good humor. <laughs> it's a very good humor. I'm going to call you the good humor man. Yeah, yeah. they call me the booby chalupa. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad. Yes, indeed. Well, one night in October of 1977, Morant said he was just going to go home, sit down, watch the World Series, and not think about Synanon for one goddamn second. Man, Mr. Morant, that's a lot of detail. Uh, yeah. All right, usually yep. just say goodnight. <laughs> one goddamn second. One goddamn second. <laughs> but before he could do that, He had to check his mail. Uh Uh-oh. Now, he didn't have his glasses on that night, but through the grill of his mailbox, he said he could see the outline of an unusually shaped package. Oh, look at that. Somebody sent my slinkies. Yeah. Yeah, wow. And when he opened the mailbox, he found a four and a half foot long rattlesnake with the rattle removed. Oh, yeah, man. This, well, th- is it poisonous then still? Oh, God, yeah. Ooh, this really? snake, the rattle isn't in the... Fu- what? The rattle is what, what? keeps this the snake away <laughs> from you. <laughs> what are you... The what? rattle's there to... I'm make sorry, I'm not a fucking know. snake expert. <laughs> <laughs> this is the least of our troubles. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> well, things that he's gotten incorrect. This is the very least <laughs> of this. I got <laughs> like, uh, this, like, it's fine. Technically, you can, he was you correct about out. the bees last yeah. week, so this cancels out. I am so usually correct. You can count the things I've got incorrect the amount of times a clock is broken. The, poop, the corn and the poop story. The b- clocks. No, you corn and poop. The, um, corn and poop. No, your g- allegorical tale yeah. right, that you said a long time ago. Um, uh, and the clocks a, actually holds up. I've had people DM list. me and tell me that that was true. That's because they're just trying to fuck you. <laughs> no, man. Just trying to have sex with you for That's kind of smart. They actually said, I got a DM saying that's kind of smart, actually. That's right. kind of smart, Just looking actually. for money. <laughs> they're, looking for, they're trying to get involved. In like, <gasps> well, the snake immediately struck Whoa. and bit Morantz on the head. And Morantz yelled, quote, Call the police! Call an ambulance! I've been bit by a goddamn rattlesnake! Oh my god. And Synanon! Synanon got me! Yeah, he's wow. running around his apartment complex Synodon screaming, Synanon got me! Jesus, there's something very symbolic about the snake as well, I suppose. Oh, yeah, dude. Because yeah. he, to them, he was a little snake in the Yes, grounds. indeed mm-hmm. he was. And as it turned out, the rattlesnake had been put in Morantz's mailbox by two Synanon members named Joe Musico and Lance Kent. Let's just say... You come at half face with even a little bit and you miss, you might get a little bit of a sniffing 
snat lint gift <laughs> yeah. in your fucking mailbox. Something like a friend. snake or something? Yeah, I, I didn't say it. Uh, like a snake. You yeah. said that. Yeah. Lance Kenton was actually the son of Stan Kenton, Ooh. famed jazz artist. All right. He's, yeah, you he's you not... see that like anyone on earth knows Stan Kenton. Fernando, play the tune. He's known for this one, The Peanut Vendor. Okay. He's very famous. <laughs> All right. It's He's extraordinarily famous. Stan Kent. Not extraordinarily famous, but this is a famous guy. <laughs> I got it. No, it's fine. I feel like okay. I'm in. All right, okay. I feel like about to, we're about to swap wives. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm a Christmas Eve in Puerto Rico. Okay. Oh, yeah. very nice. All right. Ugh, from your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> yes, indeed. But as far as Stan Kenton's son went, it's arguable that the rattlesnake in the mailbox prank that killed Stan, because he died two years later. Probably of a broken heart. Oh. Because, you know, once you break a jazz musician's heart, <laughs> it's hard to put back together. It never goes back <laughs> together. Absolutely not. This, though, was on Stan, because his son had been a lifelong Synanon member who'd lived in one of their compounds since he was 10 years old. So Stan sent him there because he didn't want him to interfere with his music career. Mm. Interesting indeed. Also, it's no, no, no. You're just saying that. It's up jazz is sometimes well, I, about the sons you don't raise. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you can't be a jazz musician and a father. No. Ugh, yuck. Well, both Lance Kenton and Joe were picked up after the getaway vehicle was traced back to Synanon because they actually waited to make sure that the rattlesnake got, got him. They are so and stupid. And then when they saw, they're like, oh, got him. Then got they, him. they, of course, sped away and someone's like, okay. This guy's screaming about a rattlesnake. <laughs> Those guys are peeling out. They brought the rattlesnake. <laughs> oh, yeah. my that's the, God. That's the rattlesnake's driver. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> and based on the tapes attained from a raid in which Diedrich said that anyone could get, quote, killed dead, physically dead for messing with Synanon, Chuck was arrested, too. Mm. Oh. Uh, but luckily for them, Paul Morantz, he got the anti-venom in time. Good. Uh, but he is still, like, Affected by the snake body. No, he alive? Him up. It, it fucks your old, he was he's still alive. alive? Yeah, no, you no. can get anti venom for uh, no, no, I'm saying he is alive uh, in real as, life. He's, as of the article that I read like two years ago, yeah, he was still alive two years ago. No shit. Yeah. He died this uh, October 23rd, 2022. Wow. Really? Yep. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, he, he, that's what he said. The is snake that, finally got him. Well, that's what he said. It was the longest murder in history. Wow. Uh, because this rattlesnake bite, it's kind of like a kind of like think of Jim Brady. Yeah, know? it fucks with you. Yeah. Now, when the police found Chuck Dieterich, he had long since tossed away his sobriety. He was arrested in his one million dollar Lake Havasu compound, staring straight ahead in a stupor with an empty bottle of Chivas Regal in front of him. <laughs> he was so drunk, in fact, and three hundred pounds to boot, that he had to be carried out of his compound. On a stretcher. Man. That is the cult leader's way to go. That's the only way I want to go, dude. <laughs> the, Having to be physically removed from my compound. Yeah. I'm too drunk to be arrested. I'm too drunk to be arrested. I'm too drunk to be arrested, sir. Officer. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dietrich was able to dodge most of the blame. Actually, he did kind of use the I'm too drunk to go to jail excuse. Yeah. He was able to dodge most of the blame because by the time the cops got to him, he'd had a stroke from being so fat. And he was suffering complications from drinking two quarts of Chivas Regal a day. So he's back to being an alcoholic. He has half a face and now he's 300 pounds and suffered a stroke. Yes. Yep. Why is he God again? <laughs> hey, hey, because sometimes God's got to fucking relax. Uh -huh. Okay. But as far as Synanon went, it very quickly found itself in the wrong climate to be a crazy, potentially murderous, bald-headed cult. Five weeks after the Rattlesnake incident, Jonestown. And Synanon had direct ties to People's Temple. Yikes. Synanon had donated supplies to Jim Jones multiple times over the years. Man, their sneaker collab was also <laughs> out of control, dog. Yeah, that's like donating the E. coli-filled beef to Bob's Big Boy. Mm -hmm. Was it Bob's Big Boy that had the E. coli? Jack in the Box. Jack, Jack in, in the, the box. box. Yeah, don't Boom. malign Bob's Big I'm Boy. I'm sorry. Yeah. I took yeah. it back. It was Bob Jack that did it. <laughs> <laughs> in the late 70s, Synanon members had played the game with members of People's Temple, where some very 
real feelings about Jim Jones were unloaded. Oh, yeah, dude. shit. And then some of them, they then got for Synanon. Yeah. He like brought him into their cult. Yeah. Synanon's still better than Jonestown. Yeah. Yes. Because, well, actually, one of the women who survived the Jonestown massacre by virtue of being at their Georgetown base when the shit went down, same place where George Jones's son was, or George Jones. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's all <laughs> I'm saying. That 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 never went to AA. <laughs> nor was he. Synanon may have helped George Jones. <laughs> it might have. Yeah, Jim Jones, you know, when all the shit went down with him, you know, she was out in uh, Georgetown. She participated in a Synanon game that was focused on Jonestown about a year after the massacre. Then she joined Synanon. Yeah. One cult to another. It was only non-cult for one year. I mean, I guess it's like slightly. It, oh, I don't know. New it's like cult, stopping new McDonald's vibes. and only yeah. eating Subway because it's kind of healthier. That's the idea. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's weird. when they started putting apple slices in McDonald's. <laughs> oh, that worked out great. Now, while the two guys who put the rattlesnake in the mailbox got off relatively light with only one year in prison for conspiracy to commit murder, they both pled no contest. Sure. Synanon never recovered, and they lost more members every year. After the rattlesnake incident, they lost 500 members. And by 1984, they were down to only 550 members, which was a precipitous drop from the almost 4,000 they had just 13 years earlier. Yeah, he's going in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Then, in 1987, there came what was eventually known as Rape Weekend. Ooh, oh, although okay. nobody was raped during Rape, rape Weekend. Oh, nobody man. was raped. Okay, I don't want to see the people that were disappointed. <laughs> yeah, why, well, then why is it called <laughs> the listeners that? listeners who was disappointed, yes. Yes, why is it called that then? Or? Well, two weeks prior to this weekend, Diedrich began showing major cracks during media interviews. Yeah, he started getting real yeah. loose-lipped. He invited various news outlets to talk. But when they showed up, Diedrich gave the interview shirtless with a half-empty bottle of vodka in his hand. Soon. Oh, oh man. man. This, is what happened. <laughs> this is what happened with Dennis Rodman. We went to North Korea. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, Diedrich proclaimed that Oliver North was a hero. Second wow. time we've mentioned Oliver why North in this series. This is like, Oliver you North want, involved. You start to wonder why conspiracy theories like really just start to shoot fucking everywhere yeah. when yeah. shit like all of these things are all on top of each other. They all know each other. They're all touching. No, they're they don't know. They don't know each other. Don't do know. That is conspiracy thought. Like they say they know each other. No. It, all, but it does like, tangentially tie to the Iran Contra. That's what I'm saying. Somewhat. It's, it adds to the coincidence. Coincidence. <laughs> coincidence. Yeah. This is it where adds you to it. Yeah. it just adds to the yeah. mess. It adds to it the adds smoke to the and yeah. to the fucking, yeah. Because uh, Diedrich, like, drunkenly mentioned Oliver North in an interview once. I'll tell you what, because Oliver North's fun. Have you ever met his fucking cousin Oliver South? I'll suck your fucking dick. You are so <laughs> stupid. Man, I'm not even allowing it. That's come come it's struck yeah. from the record. Yeah, well, Diedrich proclaimed that Oliver, Oliver North was a hero and he should run for president. And this is, like, in the middle of the Iron Contra he testimony. What's a business deal? What's a business <laughs> it's deal? A business it's a proprietary business deal. <laughs> but doesn't yeah. it show, conspiracy does show we are all connected. Yeah, that's really in all its it way. Is, it's Fern it? Gully, but for for people that are all alone in their homes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Diedrich drunkenly said that all of Synanon would vote for North because, and this is a direct quote. I want you to direct quote this one. They do what I tell them. Most of them don't even know why I do anything. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's still like, what is it, like 2,000 <laughs> votes? They do what I tell them to do. Most of them don't even know I mean, why Ro I do Ross anything. Perot got like 19 million votes. He didn't even get one electoral college. You tell me five votes. things about Ross Perot, and the only thing I'm going to tell you is Big ear dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the first two things I was going to say. Well, two weeks after that, speaking into an intercom at one of his compounds, Diedrich went on a tirade because he couldn't find his glasses. Oh, oh my God. Someone had just moved him. They cleaned his desk and they moved his glasses, but he became convinced that someone had stolen them. And he announced that, quote, theft was similar in nature to rape. Mm. My glasses. Taking, taking my his glasses. glasses was definitely close to rape. Yeah. Oh he then set off the sirens to call all Synanon members to a general meeting. And he spent the weekend comparing his lost glasses to being raped <laughs> during a series <laughs> of lectures. God, that's Jesus a fucking long game. <laughs> whose line is it anyway? Absolutely. Like, it is just a long weekend. <laughs> yeah. Wow. God, I mean, even a day of that. Can you imagine going to sleep and thinking, oh, thank God that's over. And then you wake up and he starts there's another damn thing about why my glasses yeah. got raped. Did I say my glasses got raped? Everybody get closer. Where's my belt? Yeah, this is, I mean, I can't even handle Bonnaroo. Yeah. He oh, then made an appeal for everyone to go get naked. 
and why? do a game session in the pool. Hey, man. Well, let's why? Get groovy. Let's go to a game session. The pool. Let's relax, I mean, that relax. sounds kind of fun, but it's totally not what we were talking about. Yeah, it's true. And if you're trying to set up like a fun pool weekend, maybe it shouldn't be called the rape weekend. Maybe <laughs> right. it should just be called like, hey, do we want to have a pool party? Not this <laughs> like pool long party weekend. like weekend, 72 hours of comparing the, all of this. My your, glasses. Your glasses yeah. to yeah. sexual assault. Yeah. But by that time, nobody was listening to Chuck Dietrich. He this, lost. He, he's gone. He's uh, after Rape Weekend, as it came to be known. They refer to it as Rape Weekend afterwards. Yeah. Okay. More than half of Synanon left. Yeah. They're yeah. like, you know. Yeah. Ah, it was. A, it was because up till that point, they could still kind of say like, OK, he's got some good ideas. But then after spending a weekend of him comparing lost glasses to something so fucking awful, hammered the entire time. Yes, oh, yeah. They're like, OK. I'm I'm out. I'm getting out of here. I don't care. I'll go back to the fucking streets. I can't listen to this shit anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like, literally go back to the street. Yeah. Why not? 290 people were left out That's of 2,000. This guy is sucks as yeah. a cult leader. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. What finally killed Sinanon, though, the IRS. Ooh, they always get their Uh-oh. man, don't they, yeah, man? I guess so. Sinanon had lost their religious status, and by 1989, they owed 17 million in back taxes. <laughs> wow, dude. Yeah. That is just That's American, a lot. Man. That's like one of those numbers you look at and you just like, laugh. Okay, sure. <laughs> 17 yeah, million dollars. Let me call my accountant who's a leprechaun. Yeah. And then right he'll call that. my guarantor who's a fucking unicorn. Yeah, I will get right on that. They declared bankruptcy and Synanon officially dissolved. Oh. But Synanon's legacy remains. While the game went out of vogue with adults, plenty of people in the troubled teen community took it and ran with it no. in all the wrong ways, particularly the Elon schools. Uh-oh. So, who would take a relatively benign concept like the game and turn it into a punishment? What kind of person is so sadistic that they would take something obviously meant for adults and skew it into something to be used on kids in the most brutal ways possible? The answer is Joe Ritchie, the founder of Elon School. Oh. He'll be our focus for the conclusion to our series on the troubled teen industry, although he'll certainly share the bill with Elon School's most famous alumnus, convicted murderer, Michael Skakel. It is, wow. this whole story has been both, it's like, this is kind of the more funny section of a very intense, yeah. sad topic. And so next week, it's like, again, we're going to get into Joseph Ritchie's life. I want to say thank you to everybody who sent me emails. Yeah. Like all we, there are so many oh, yeah. people that have been a part of these programs that are still going. Like, as you just see, did you see the Agape? Like that, that place, the school this week, it just closed. Really? It literally, it, it I want to say like Two days ago, they just voluntarily Two closed their ago? doors. The, wow. the, the, the Agape Boarding School in Missouri. We did it again, boys. It is really <laughs> weird. another disgusting cult uh, to close down. Well, thank you all so much it's for really, listening. Seriously, and there are many other shows that have covered things that from people that have had like these experiences. There's the Sunshine Place, which talks to a lot of people Ugh. that experienced this. That True Non story, a lot of those kids, like those, that podcast people had developed, like were in these systems. Mm-hmm. And so- it's it's just everywhere. But next week we're getting into Joseph Ritchie territory, which mm. is it's it's weirdly Chuck Dieterick, but without the charisma. Yeah. Oh my goodness. But people still like we'll get to it. There's like a hero worship about him in a way. It's a weird, right. a very Same weird thing. thing. Kind of. It's, it's a hero worship amongst uh, fucking sociopathic morons. Yes. Right. Like that's the people that were really drawn to Joe Ritchie. But yeah, he's a. A unique piece of shit. I'll say that. Indeed. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for listening. Let's see. Do we want to talk about the release, the Butthole Cut Tour? You want to come out and see the release, the Butthole Cut yes. Tour? Wizard and Bruiser on page seven, but taking their entertainment wares across this country they of are. ours. I'm going to get them out there with their tap dancing for your dollars. You Literally dancing. You they dance see. more than us and they sing more than us. They oh, do. Yeah. Yes. So go check them out. They are in San Francisco at the Independent this Friday, January. 13th, nice. go check them out. And then this Sunday, January 15th, at Los Angeles at the Bourbon Room, and a couple of us will be there to yell at you as well. Yes. Uh, Don't expect me. No, he's going to be, he's going to be <laughs> betting on his games. Don't expect me. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much for listening. Do we have anything else, boys? Uh, Thanks for supporting blah, 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 all the shows. we got our serious yeah. shows, which are going so great. Open lines and hail yourself. Thanks for everyone who's calling in. Last comic book on the left is coming soon. Yeah. Uh, number par- Issue number two. 
Awesome. Uh, we got some great stuff coming up for issue number three yes. as well. Yes, we do. And then uh, eventually we will tell you where you can purchase our new comic book that we're writing for Dark Horse called Operation Sunshine. Yep. So we'll let you know when that awesome. is coming out. Um, but yeah. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening. Hail yourselves. Hail Satan. Hugging. Maka Stalash Arms. And always remember, today is the first day and the rest of your life. <laughs> I can't believe an alcoholic cult leader coined that phrase. Right? Isn't that incredible? <laughs> Nothing is sacred. No. Nope. Nothing is right. Nope. <laughs> <laughs>This show is made possible by listeners like you. Thanks to our ad sponsors. You can support our shows by supporting them. For more shows like the one you just listened to, go to lastpodcastnetwork.com.